to review it later. Yep. Thank you, Carrie. Yep. Uh, this will be recorded so that way um, you know people can review it afterwards. So don't worry. I know it's going to feel like you're drinking fire water out of a fire hose. We totally get that. But we also just have a lot of things that we need to cover uh, as, as we get the background. So with that, um, we do have one uh, just um, you know perfunctory thing we need to do, and that is to you've all been sent the meeting uh, the March meeting notes minutes um, that Carrie's compiled for us graciously. I had no edits to them; they looked really good. But I just wanted to see: does anybody have any edits or changes that need to happen to those meeting notes? Maybe use your raise hand if you do. Going once, going twice. I know, Mark, you're on the phone, so just chime in if you need to. Okay, great. Well, seeing no changes needing to be made, can someone please make a motion to approve those minutes? Looks like Kevin will, but Kevin, will you come off mute so we can? Yeah, um, yeah, sorry <laughs> for being late. Zoom decided. No, no problem. No, we're good. We're totally fine. Okay, great. So, Never had more problems getting onto Zoom. So yes, no. I move that we approve the minutes because I did indeed read them. So perfect, great, Kevin. And Kemi, do you want to second that? Looks like yes. you got off. I, okay. yes. I second Thank the you. motion. Thank you. Perfect, great. All right. Well, uh, any objections? Okay. Well, if that, then we have approved our minutes and done our uh, perfunctory for uh, thing to keep us legal, uh, legal legal. So that's good. So with that, I'm not going to delay much more just because we're going to make up for a little bit of time. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark, who can get us started on our um, presentation tonight. And once again, thank you so much for the Anne Arundel County staff that are joining us. We know this is a late evening and you have families and that. So thank you very much on behalf of the committee. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. So I do want to apologize to everybody. This was, don't worry I don't know what happened, happened. The link in the, the passcode, but I'm glad everybody's here and I hope uh, some more members of the public are able to attend. Um, I'm, I'm gonna pass it to Carrie. Carrie saved our bacon here tonight by also sending out um, some last minute um, reminders to the public and, and posting some of this information on the website. So Carrie, if you're, if you, if you're good to go, I'm gonna hand it off to you for this agenda item. Yeah, thanks. I just, I'm very impressed with everyone who's here for getting through it. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to all the other Carrie and I's on the call. Um, and one thing to add before we get started, um, welcome to our county experts who are here. Um, we're really excited to hear from you. And I know for the SAC, we are giving you a lot of information tonight and not everyone may have the chance to, to talk or may not feel comfortable talking um, in the moment. So we've set up a Jamboard. I, I sent it out to you earlier today. We're not going to share screen on that. That is for you um, to add recommendations to. Remember, the goal of this meeting and all of our meetings is to develop strategies and recommendations for the region plan. So since you're familiar with all the plan 2040 goals and strategies and you've read through the briefing packet, um, use this time with the presentations and discussion to ask yourself how to make um, these goals a reality in the region. Think about what's missing from um, the goals that you're aware of, where there might be gaps or more information that you need or, um, you know, stronger implementation um, that, and ask yourselves how this work can support what the agencies are presenting to us tonight. So feel free to message me on the side if you can't find the link to the Jamboard, but um, we encourage you to use that to capture your thoughts. And we will return to that Jamboard over the next couple of uh, weeks and months to make sure that we are um, cruising along on uh, similar directions toward recommendations. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to the Office of Emergency Management to kick us off. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. We're here, and that's great. Um, again, my name is Preeti Emmerich, and I'm the Director of the Office of Emergency Management. I have a presentation that'll go through a little bit of what we do. I think a lot of people are not familiar with what the Office of Emergency Management does and how it relates to land use and some of the initiatives that we're working on related to Plan 2040. So I, I hope this is good information that will help folks here. So let me share my screen. Can everybody see it should be a PowerPoint presentation? All right, I got the thumbs up. So let's start from the beginning. 
So a little bit about what emergency management is. Um, there are four phases in emergency management and there's a brief description here on the slide. I won't read them all, but I'll summarize them a little bit. Number one, to mitigate, and that's a lot of what we're gonna be talking about in the presentation. We wanna prevent future emergencies or minimize their effects. And how do we do that? We prepare. And a lot of that is through planning, through training, through exercises with our county partners, with our external stakeholders, with community members, et cetera. Respond when the unfortunate does happen, whether it's a tornado or hurricane, or really any other situation, emergency management is all hazards. The approach we take is used to respond to any type of emergency that happens. Obviously we wanna protect life and property. And then after we respond, there's a recovery. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, recovery can take a long time. And whether we accept the new normal or try to get things back to where they were, that is also a, a very special, unique piece that emergency management has, has a role in. And again, we test and train and exercise with our partners. And that's key here, right? It's not just county agencies, it's our partners like Fort Meade, which we're currently planning to exercise with to take place in September. It's with our community. And that's, I'm very happy to be here presenting because the community matters. And especially when we talk about mitigation, what the community can do to collaborate with us is so important. We base this on what we do in mitigation, um, preparedness, response and recovery. It's all in our emergency operation plans. It is in our framework of how we're gonna respond, how we coordinate, um, especially when we're trying to get assistance um, from the state and federal partners and other resources and other sources. Um, and this framework can respond to the tiniest of emergencies that might happen to possibly knock on wood category five, right? So we can either scale down or scale up, but the coordination is the same. Again, to be able to respond and return either to the new normal or pre-disaster state. And where do we do this coordination? It's through our Emergency Operations Center. Um, that's where, again, we work with our partners and stakeholders and coordinating the resources and the assets that might be needed um, in order to respond to the effects of the communities on the hazards. And again, this is where that collaboration happens to make sure that we're not missing anything and that providing that appropriate oversight and to make sure there's minimal disruption to our county government, but also to the community. Mitigation is the center of the universe. So especially with the Office of Emergency Management and the Maryland Department of Emergency Management, mitigation is key. We wanna minimize what is the impacts to the environment, to our land use, because that also impacts access to emergency services, public health matters, um, our critical infrastructure, so mitigating that even before the incident happens is key. So Office of Emergency Management is in charge of our hazard mitigation plan. And a lot of what you see in plan 2040 in with land use, our hazard mitigation plan does tie into. And based on what our hazard mitigation plan says our hazards are, especially our natural hazards, that um, informs how we train, how we plan, how we, um, get the county um, agencies ready on how to um, effectively execute the four phases of emergency management. So our hazard mitigation plan obviously evaluates the extent, the probability of a particular hazard impacting Anne Arundel County and what is our capabilities in order? What are our actions that we can respond to reduce the risk? Now, there are some big hazards that have a less likelihood of happening but that also means what is our capability to respond to that? And if our capability is not up to standard, it's not up to par, it is our responsibility to fill in those gaps. And again, with the hazard mitigation plan, we actually are required to have one in order to receive FEMA grant funding. So not only is it required, but it's also beneficial to the community. So our last hazard, hazard mitigation planning team, which occurred in 2018, um, we engaged, obviously, in this whole community approach um, to making sure that we understood all the hazards, natural hazards that impact the community, and all the resources and capabilities that we have in order to respond and to recover and prepare. So you can see the agencies that deal with land use, especially OPZ, 
public safety and the administration. And even if you see like the administration, that is, you see BGE, right? Again, an external stakeholder that's not a government um, agency, but obviously has a lot to do with how um, we recover in terms of power, especially to the critical infrastructures. But what we really need to focus on is the community. It's great to have land use and public safety and the administrations there. But what we need is representatives from the community, the neighborhood groups who could tell us, hey, my road floods often, and what can we do about that? How can I be better prepared? Or a business that needs to be up and running. And as we saw with the coastal flooding, with especially the city of Annapolis, a lot of those businesses lost you know, um, revenue, but they lost the ability to service the public. And that's what we want to make sure the community and the business can come to their, um, be a, um, can recover as soon as possible. So our hazard identification and risk assessment, as you can see on these screens, these are the hazards that pose the greatest risk for the potential damages and loss to human life. So flooding, as you can see, severe thunderstorms and hailstorms, hurricane winds, severe winter storms, tornado, and erosion. And you might think erosion, but with all the flooding we've had and with the hurricanes and tornadoes, erosion can occur. And that is an issue for our land and especially with the land use. So flooding has been identified as the most common natural hazard affecting the communities. And again, that impacts a lot of our goals in Plan 2040. And when we talk about critical infrastructure, access to public um, safety services and for public health needs. So mitigation actions, again, as I said, what can we do to build a resiliency? What mitigation can, actions can we take as county government, but also for the communities to lessen the impacts? Hurricanes are gonna happen. Tornadoes are gonna happen. We can't stop those from happening, but how can we be better prepared as a community? And especially in the last couple of years, the severity of the storms have increased. The frequency of the storms have increased. How can we protect our lands from that? And again, some of the issue, uh, some of the ways, um, strengthening, strengthening, excuse me, building codes and land use policies to make sure that we do protect our lands. But most importantly, preparing people, property owners, critical facilities, and infrastructures to withstand the impacts of those. Um, uh, natural hazards. So you can see in this handy dandy chart, I'm not going to go over it, but the ones highlighted in red are the ones that most frequently occur. And these are natural hazards of events affecting the county from 1950 to 2018. And once we do our update of the hazard mitigation plan, I think it's in 2023, we'll have updated numbers, and especially that we've had a lot of natural hazards affect us. But as you can see, flooding, the thunderstorm, the winter storms, Winter storms, you know, they can be bad. They may not cause a lot of flooding, but they affect the infrastructure and especially, especially the conditions of the roads, tornadoes and erosion. So I just wanted to highlight some of the recent events that have affected us. Ida and the EF2 tornado, um, the coastal flood event, um, and especially the winter storm. And I understand that this didn't affect region two. But as a whole, we should be take a look at a lot of these things could have gone through region two, right? And so the better we are prepared in terms of how we use the land and how we can protect the land, the better off we are. So that leads to my next point of disaster resilience. And this is where we need your help. We need to be resilient to disasters and whether that's protecting our land, making sure we understand land use, but making sure that the community has the ability to recover from the effects of the hazards. And especially with climate change, especially with sea level rise, we are coordinating not only with DPW, but the OPNZ and a lot of the studies they are doing in terms of the coastal um, flooding, flooding inland, which can also happen in region two. Um, having taken a tour of Anne Arundel County, flooding just doesn't affect when the hurricane comes to shady side, it can affect even inland and especially um, um, restrict access or impact critical infrastructure. Um, so making sure that we have effective management and implementation of the plans and coordinating 
you know, we talk about state and federal, but also with our local partners and the agencies that actually study these and making sure that our plans talk to each other and reference each other. Um, and especially with plan 2040, I know our hazard mitigation plan can definitely have an impact on that, but also with the sea level rise and the climate change studies that are being done. One of the ways we talk about disaster resilience is that the Office of Emergency Management is pursuing grant funding so that we can um, fund mitigation projects in coordination with agencies such as DPW and OPMC. And BRIC funding is a federal grant program that is really focused on mitigation projects to reduce risk to life, property, and critical infrastructure, reduce any further losses, to those, but also making sure that um, if there's any effects from natural hazards, we'd be able to respond to them. And most importantly, improving the long-term resiliency of a community to a disaster. And now with BRIC funding, mitigation projects must incorporate future risks to sea level rise and climate change. You know, the federal government and the state government, their focus is on what can these natural hazards do and how are they evolving and how can communities um, um, face those risks? So these are some of the projects that we have submitted or have been approved by um, FEMA. Number one is the countywide roadway vulnerability study and this is countywide, not just for the coastal areas, right? On what vulnerability we have with the roadways and the bridges. Um, and so this is actually something, I think the kickoff meeting has started soon on this project led by DPW that has federal funding uh, that it would be completed in the next couple of years. Two projects I know that may not touch upon directly to region two is uh, something we have submitted for further consideration. Shadyside, again, an area that does flood a lot um, and the Sawmill Creek uh, Tributaries Restoration Project. Um, Again, something that may not directly impact region two at some points, but again, the same methodology we're using can be used for flooding inland as well. I wanna to touch upon, we talk about land use and resiliency of land use and working with DPW and OPMZ and actually inspections and permits on building codes, et cetera, making sure that the use of the land um, um, doesn't impact how we can respond. Um, to natural hazards. You know, one of the ways we have improved and that we're looking to expand um, our critical um, resources and infrastructure is our partnership with the schools and mass care shelters. As you can see, I've listed the primary and secondary shelters. Um, and this is important. We are continually adding schools um, that could serve as mass care shelters so we can expand the number of shelters that we have. And we're working with the state and the school system to make sure that future um, building um, frameworks of schools actually can support a mass care shelter. And especially for the high schools, this is important. You know, elementary and middle schools, they're hard to use as shelters because the sizing, you think of the bathrooms are not made for adults. But now schools have an obligation that when they have new construction, they serve a dual purpose to help the community and to help the community build that resiliency and respond to disasters. And last, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about individual preparedness, right? And some of the things we can do for our families, for our communities to prepare ourselves for, again, unfortunate events. Um, we do presentations about building kits, making a plan. Very importantly for um, zoning and land use, knowing your zone for flooding, right? A lot of people sometimes don't. I'm just becoming more knowledgeable about the area you live in and understanding just because you may not live on the coast, you may live in an area where a road floods and how do you prepare for that? Where do you prepare for a time you may not be able to access public safety needs, which we do coordinate with fire and police to prepare or that you may not be able to exit your house. Signing up to receive alerts, that's key when there's a tornado warning, right? when there are weather reports that severe weather can come, knowing ahead of time, so making those plans in order to protect your family and the community is key. And then lastly, participating in the 2025 hazard mitigation plan update. That is so important to understand how natural hazards affect the land you live on, 
right? But being involved in the development of the plan and what resources, what other plans that we need to understand and especially understanding within each region the natural hazards that might face you. That's the end of my presentation. I know it's a lot of information. I actually had to scale it down so you guys could get out of here before midnight. Um, but there's any other information, there's our website where um, actually you could find our emergency operations plan, our hazard mitigation plan, take a read through if you have any questions. Please feel free to email us to give us a call. There is our office number. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was really, really helpful. Um, as we talked about earlier, for those that have joined uh, a little late, uh, we're going to try to keep this to one minute per person uh, from the SAC committee. So if you have questions, please use the raise hand function. Um, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, there's the ellipses and then there's uh, raise hand. So if you can do that and then I can we can call on you to then um, see if what questions you have. So any questions or comments? Yes, uh, Kimmy, I see you have a question. Yes, thank you, Ms. Hemrick. Um, regarding knowing your flood zone, I just want to make sure I have the um, link correctly, mdfloodmaps.com. Is that right? Mm, go uh, back to... I think it was second to your last presentation. Yes, um, MD, mdfloodmaps.com. .com. Okay, thank you. Great, Val, I see you have a question. Val, you're still on mute. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Go, I had a quick question about fallout shelters with the glowing uh, unrest in the world with China and Russia. What is the Anne Arundel County doing, is, if anything, for fallout shelters for us as a community? I think with the fallout shelters, we have to be cognizant, obviously, of what's going on in the world and making sure to receive alerts um, when things are happening. Um, I, I want to caution that there is, you know, obviously talk with unrest in the world in the Ukraine, with China, um, to make sure that you're signed up to receive alerts and that you're taking the necessary measures that you think is good for your family and for the community. Um, I know fallout shelters, um, we talk about that like in the 60s with the Cold War, and there are more and more questions coming out about that. But I really want to stay focused on making sure that you have the alerts, that you follow the instructions if something were to occur, and to understand that the risk of what is happening in the Ukraine, um, um, balance the risk of what's happening in the Ukraine, in China, et cetera, with what feasible um, 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 response and recovery that you might be able to employ. Great, thank you. Nicole? Um, two things. One, the primary shelter for Crofton is not um, feasible for those of us in far west county. So for like mm -hmm. the Laurel, Maryland City, Jessup area, that as a primary shelter is not feasible for those of us. Um, Mead or someplace of that nature as a primary shelter for us is more feasible. Um, and and naturally it is. We took it off the list. Mead is undergoing construction. Correct. At this point. So at until it completes construction, it is not a feasible um, shelter. You're right in terms of safety. Um, so once that the construction is completed, it will go back on the list. Correct. But if something were to happen tomorrow, that needs to be taken into consideration because for those residents in far west county getting to Crofton is, is not a feasible option. So just as, as a note, if something were to happen tomorrow, you guys really need to take that into consideration. And oh, and I just want to respond to that. And we do. So that's not the exhaustive list of places that you could shelter. And okay. it's very situation dependent, especially if something were to happen in the region that you can't stay in your area, you may have to travel out. But those are all considered, taken into consideration when we talk about um, incidents and a scenario case-by-case uh, -case basis. Gotcha, and Brockbridge Road floods, 
you know, as on a regular basis. Yes. Going towards the PG side, you guys did make significant remediations with these little underground tunnel things and mm -hmm. what have you, and it has worked significantly. Going towards the Howard County side, the only thing that was done were these gates to alert folks to not travel that way or what have you. Is there a way that we can get those same remediations with the tunnels or whatever for the water flow to go on that side because they have significantly worked on the PG side. Okay. We really need those to go or something of that nature to go on the Howard County side. Those gates are not sufficient because people drive through them, they drive around them, what have you. We really need the same remediation to go on the Howard County side. And that is something definitely I could take note of and jot down and, and coordinate with. Yeah, because I, I when you mentioned your grant thing, because yeah. um, that is that flooding that happens every time we had rain last week, you mm -hmm. know, with that mini hurricane or earlier this week that yeah. kind of blew through and it flooded. Yeah. And yeah. we've had significant deaths in that um, uh, stretch of Brockbridge Road, you know, several times a year. And so I think that would meet your federal criteria. No, excellent. Thank you. Mm hmm. Well, excellent. Well, not seeing any more comments. I think these are great. I really appreciate it. So I want to thank uh, Ms. Emmerich for your great presentation. And uh, Mark, do you want to introduce the next speaker? Thank yeah, you so, all. Uh, thank you. I apologize that we, um, Office of Emergency Management, need to go first. Um, so I apologize for that in the agenda. Um, but up next, we have Gregory Sturt from uh, Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Good evening, uh, Greg Stewart, Senior Manager of Planning for Public Schools. Um, I'm going to assume Mark will have the PowerPoint presentation that he can share. Uh, just a few slides that I put together just to kind of give you an overview of um, your Region 2 and what schools are a part of that. Uh, just to give you a little background, uh, Anne Arundel County is the 38th largest school system in the nation. Um, and we're fourth largest in the state. So we do have a lot of students, um, about 80, 83,000 students, and uh, it's growing. Um, in the past, you know, 10 years ago, I think we had about 77,000, and about 10 years from now, we're projected about 93,000. So we're continuing to uh, grow. And uh, with that, uh, we've got some challenges ahead of us that we're going to try to address. Um. I would just like to invite our SAC at this time while we're transitioning between agencies to please consider using that space to add your notes to the Jamboard. I think we heard some threads of good recommendations in the previous presentation and discussion, and this is a good time to capture that. I'm going to see if Mark has the Yep, it's coming up right now here. Okay. Sorry, I would have shared screen, but I was figuring you had it all, so. Okay, is that up for you? Yeah, it's kind of weird format right now. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So this is the uh, region. Um, I listed the eight elementary schools that are within that boundary and two middle schools and the high school. Uh, two schools I did not list only because the charter school, basically there's a Monarch Global that's located near Brockbridge Elementary and then also the Chesapeake Science Point that's in uh, Hanover. Um, so those are two other schools that technically are some of our students do go there. Um, but again, this just gives you a general idea of, of the area, uh, what's involved in the different boundaries. Um, a lot of that land in the, in the center, uh, especially in the Manor View, those all, most of that's all Fort Meade. And the big yellow area, where uh, most of that's federal land. Uh, there are some recent developments that are occurring there. And, um, you know, we're, we're kind of dealing with that right now. It was kind of interesting. Uh, watershed, formerly known uh, Rumble Gateway actually uh, paid for the construction of Monarch Global back to get their subdivision approved. Uh, unfortunately, before they even built a single home, the entire school is 100% full. And, and part of the reason for that is the way the APF law was written, 
uh, until recently, uh, developers just had to look at a chart. And if, it's, if it was open, they were allowed to build as many homes as they could possibly fit in. Um, and we've been constantly trying to play catch up. So unfortunately, uh, Watershed, which is a brand new subdivision, um, and I know uh, Jim's on the call, his, his development company is um, overseeing that. Um, we're gonna have a challenge out there. Um, you know, we do have some sites for a school um, in the Russet area. The problem we have is they cost about $50 million to build. And it is not in our six year plan. Uh, and I can tell you from a debt affordability, I don't think it would make it in our six year plan. So it's definitely on the outside of that. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, I'll kind of show you um, kind of the different state rated capacities that we have at schools. And I'll wait for Mark to click on that. That's the page down. So what I did was I looked back 10 years ago, the current uh, is the blue, and then basically look 10 years out just to kind of give you an idea of, of these schools in this area. And again, these are strictly the elementary schools. And you can kind of see at Brockbridge, um, we've done some additions out there. And, you know, the, the black bar basically climbs up as we did additions. Uh, same thing, uh, Hebron Harmon, there was an addition built by actually by developers. And then Jessup, we did a brand new school. We replaced it and added capacity. On uh, Manor View, you'll see it drop down. And part of that was um, on base, there was a lot of housing changes and they had uh, reduced the number of housing in it. So we actually reduced the, the number of um, basically the square footage we took at the media center and basically made it an open area. And, um, and then Maryland City is the big one where we see a lot of growth. And the reason is because that watershed subdivision is targeted to go into um, Maryland City. And as you can see, it, it won't fit in the future. Um, and we are aware of that. Uh, Mead Heights, uh, again, we're seeing a lot of growth, but we're in the process of adding on additions over there. Uh, Pershing Hill was replaced um, back in 2011. And um, sometimes what happens is you'll see a, de a decrease like that one. There was actually a decrease in the SRC. And sometimes what happens is we add either all day K where it might've been half day K. And that re basically reduces the capacity of a school. There could have been programs added, whether they're additional resources. So sometimes the SRC is changed because of program changes. And then Westmead is a early childhood center. It used to be a Westmead Elementary School back in the day, um, back before Persian was built. We actually combine Westmead and Persian into a, a new uh, Persian Hill became the, the uh, school for those two. And then we converted the uh, Westmead into an early education center. Um, so we're kind of looking at, you know, we, again, we do um, projections every single year. We're in the process now of doing the the master plan for the, the current year were required under state law to provide um, basically the 10 year projections every single year. And by law, we have to have it to the state by July 1st. Uh, we'll have that to our board of that in June and then it gets approved and then basically um, it's published. It's a fairly significant document that covers all, all the different schools we have. Uh, if you go to the next slide, it will show you the secondary schools just to give you an idea. Um, MacArthur, uh, that is on base. Um, actually, all three of these sit on base. Uh, the MacArthur is a little unique because it's actually behind the security fence. And that poses many challenges for us. Um, there are a lot of, um, I'm gonna say undocumented um, residents. And the problem with that is the children can get on base, but the parents cannot. Uh, so if there's an emergency, they cannot pick up their child. So we've actually had to move children off MacArthur into Mead Middle School. And we are dealing with that. And the big problem we have at MacArthur, we have probably a thousand seats open. And um, it's really hard to get to those seats to fill them up. Uh, currently the gate was moved back, but it didn't go back far enough to allow us to get public access like we have on both Mead Middle and Mead High School. Uh, Mead Middle, we've done some work recently. It's, it's, a, it's a newer school. Um, and Mead High School, we are in the middle of a major renovation, about $125 million renovation. And, um, and that one, we've also done some athletic improvements um, 
over the years as well. So it's a combination of outside and inside work. And we're continuing with, um, with that project to basically spruce that entire facility up. And then uh, next slide, if you would. Uh, this is our, these are future school sites. Um, and again, I included uh, the Van Bocklin area. There's a middle school site behind Van, B Van Bocklin. Uh, currently there's only, we have about 15 acres left. We gave the county 10 and the county also has a 15 acre park next to it. So we're gonna incorporate that into the school when it gets developed in the future as, as the needs arise. Uh, we also have the, you'll see the double circles. That's the Russet site. It's about a 75 acre site we've owned for about 25 years. And um, that actually could, could house both a, an elementary and a middle school. Uh, we did a quick little feasibility study a number of years ago back when, actually when the county was looking at a water tower, uh, which I think that was a comment that was brought to my attention um, earlier today or last night. And um, so we have those two. Uh, big concern I have in this area uh, in the west part of the county is uh, the county is, a lot of the land out here, especially up near the airport, um, up near Arundel Mills was all commercial zone property. And what they've been doing and allowing is these overlays where they can allow residential construction on commercial or industrial property. And it is a real problem for us because uh, as you go further north, there are no public lands or public school sites. So unless we can get ahead of that, um, especially with all these overlays and there's a recent bill with a BRAC, um, you know, where you can have R15 or R22. And that is a concern. Um, we are gonna get behind the eight ball on that um, unless, you know, as these lands are allowed to be changed for residential, you know, from commercial industrial to residential, unless we can preserve land uh, for schools or even libraries, um, fire police, whatever, the public infrastructure, uh, this county is going to be in a lot of trouble. And I know we've, uh, the county under the 2040 plan, there's a lot of areas up here that have been targeted for uh, mixed use. And, you know, again, if you look back at the original zoning, you know, especially around the airport, uh, that was all supposed to be commercial and industrial. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to face a problem. Uh, I know the county planning and zoning um, county, you know, the county council has been very uh, favorable of changing these and allowing these overlays. Um, but in reality, no one's really looked at the impact. Um, you know, I took the one bill that was just recently the bill 3122, and the way it was written, it said, you know, five acre site um, within four miles of Fort Meade could be developed into, I think it was R15 or R22. And um, I calculated just based on parcels, there are 8,300 acres of five acre parcels. Now that doesn't include all the one acre pieces that could be combined into a five acre piece because that's allowed under the bill. Um, but that basically equates to about 25,000 students. Hey, Greg, this is Jim Kraft. Can I comment yeah. on that real quick? Sure. So that, that bill is only, my read of it, is only limited to C4 and W1 and MXD parcels. It's not every parcel within a four mile radius. You know, I thought the same thing, Jim, but there was the way they bracketed the paragraph. They basically deleted all that and it left, the only part was left was if it was over five acres, so. Right, you know, I think I think it's right. worth just, just checking the section of the code because under the bulk regs, there's, um, in the in the use matrices, it, it's only a permitted use in those particular zones. So, yeah. just to clarify, it's not my read of it. And um, okay, a couple of questions. Yeah, it's just it. It's a, it was a concern. What you know, the the one take that I saw, at least the draft I saw, maybe I saw an earlier version, but the way it was bracketed, um, you know, somebody deleted that part of the zoning, which was surprising. So, if, if it's been corrected and, and that was left in, then that certainly would reduce it. So, yeah, Actually, I'm hoping that that was caught. This is Marilee, I can add to that. Um, that was council that bracketed that out because the permitted uses were already in the permitted use charts. That's why they took that out. So it is only allowed in those three zones. Yeah, and again, my, my question would be, well, how many acres is that? Does anybody, has did anybody tally that up to tell you know somebody that this means X number of units? And that's the big question that I've always asked. Whenever these things come out, no one's ever, that actually has been mapped up. 
that actually is being mapped out. Well, hopefully it was mapped before it was put up to the board council. has an impact on very few properties. Oh, you're breaking up. Yeah, I think that was Thomas just saying it, it impact very few properties and it, it sounded like they were mapping it out. But yeah, I think the other key thing to note is that if the schools are at capacity, then they, new development can't proceed, right, Greg? Well, that's not totally true, Jim. As you know, you can wait six years and then you're free to go. So, right, But if, if someone were to apply for development in a school site that wanted to proceed sooner rather than later or with the timing of plan 2040 and that school was closed, then that, that development could not proceed other than waiting for the six years, right? Right, but again, the option they can always wait. And, and, it, and again, it gets back to a, a financial question is, you know, can you afford to wait or, or is it worth paying the, paying the additions? I mean, we've had some very successful projects um, with the development community, as you know, you know, for additions, both at, you know, Mead High School, we did a 12 classroom addition, Harmon's at a four classroom, um, Broadneck High School. You know, so we, we are certainly, um, we would hope the development community would, would work with us to, to do this. You know, certainly we are in a position that, you know, if a developer, if we could work something out where we could do uh, density trading, where somebody said, you know, something was owned, you know, R5 and they could get R10 and, you know, part of that could be set aside for a public school, you know, the, you know, some of those where they could keep the same amount of density, but um, we could set aside some public lands for schools. It would be very be uh, beneficial up in the northern part of the county or western northern. Mr. Stewart, are you finished with your presentation? Oh, uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, excellent. Well, I, let me add, add one more thing just so everybody knows. Um, we are undertaking a um, comprehensive redistricting um, for not just this area, but um, basically at least four of the feeders. And we're going to be working on that. Um, it'll be coming out later this fall. And you know what our, our goal is with an opening of a new high school, we need to make adjustments. We also are looking at, you know, if anybody looks at like SRC's capacities, we're trying to balance um, the best we can. So that's something that's coming down the pike. So with that, I'll take any questions. Great, so as a reminder, if the SAC folks could use the raise hand function, whether you have a question or a comment, and if we could try to keep, keep it to a minute a piece, that would be very helpful. Uh, so Mark Thompson is the first person I see. So Mark, why don't we go ahead and go with you and then we'll go with Jim Crap. Mark? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that with respect to redistricting, um, Greg, is how would that potentially impact um, our, our uh, regional plan area? Or um, it, it's gonna totally affect your regional plan. Um, the entire Mead cluster is within the redistricting that we're, we're undertaking. Um, we're looking at both uh, basically, it's the Old Mill, the Mead, North County, and um, and Glen Burnie. So those are currently the targets. I mean, there's 31 elementary schools, eight middle schools, um, basically four high schools, five high schools, if you include the new uh, Old Mill West. Um, and again, you know, as we look at that, we may reach out and go into it on other areas that if we have areas that are just a you know, budding that we we can solve some issues. Um, we're going to try to do that too. So, and then we've got a, just to let you, I mean, we've got other areas down South that, you know, I might be over by a hundred kids down at a school or I've got plenty of room in another where we could take a, say a school bus and just make it turn left instead of right. So, you know, we're, we're kind of looking, you know, not the whole County, but majority of the North County is over. It's a good third of the County that's being affected with this redistrict. Great. All right, Jim. Yeah, I was just going to ask if, if Greg could touch on um, how impact fees play a role in school capacity and in, in new construction. Well, we fortunately there is a, uh, a task force right now that's looking at the impact fees, and um, you know we do use impact fees uh, to fund the school construction. Again, it doesn't pay for renovation, but if we add capacity, it makes it basically uh, impact fee eligible. Um, so that's kind of where we use the money. Uh, the, the tough thing is impact fees are not collected until uh, building permit time usually. Um, 
and we, you know, again, we're trying to get it. We need to get out there and build some of the schools. Uh, the tough thing we have is making sure, one, do we have the property to even look at building a school? Um, and, and what happens, you know, and what's happened over and even in this area of, of Mead, and it, it's actually, it's been all over the county. It's easier for us to go ahead and just keep adding additions um, versus trying to do a ground up school. I mean, over the past, say, 15 years, you know, we built, you know, basically an elementary school. Uh, we just finally built a high school that was, you know, on the books for a long time. So it's not like we built a lot of new schools. We had a lot of, of capacity or we've added to the schools. Um, I've, I've I did a study once and looking at SRCs just over, over a period of time. And, you know, we've increased SRCs more, you know, more than we added additions. And some of that is, you know, we go through and look at the square basically the square footage is the how the school is being used and we will re-rate the school uh, you know sometimes you'll find you know we've got historical stuff where it might have had two teacher lounges for example and we we're like well you can't have two teacher lounges it's a classroom so it gets rated as a classroom so you know we've gone through um, a couple of years ago we were part of the state we actually did every single school and um so we kind of make those adjustments um, with that. But, you know, impact fees are used for anything. Anytime we do additions, um, adding square footage, adding capacity, um, that's, that's kind of used. And, um, but again, the study that's being done by the, by the county right now is to look at, you know, what is a reasonable impact fee? Um, just to give you an idea of a seat, it costs last time we did uh, some schools, it's $55,000 a seat to build a school. Um, just to give you a, a, a round number um, when we do this. So, and the tough thing we have, if I've got 10,000 available seats around the county, like out at Chesapeake, I've got 2,000 seats open. You know, you know why, why spend money if I've got seats? So that's part of the redistricting where you try to, you know, utilize as much as you can. Um, probably have as Chesapeake is at the end of the peninsula and getting there is, is makes a challenge for transportation. Great, I'll hand it over to Nicole Walsh. The property in the um, behind the Russet community um, has been there since Russet community was built 25 years. It's been uh -huh. on the list, off the list, on the list, off the list for every one of those 25 years. Um, a lot of us um, in this task force has have lived in that community or currently live in that community. When a lot of people bought their homes, they told us they were gonna put a school there. It's still not there. Um, Severna Park High School has been built, rebuilt, $2 million turf fields, then they put the new school on top of them twice. You know what I mean? And now that all of those elementary schools are full, I live right behind Jessup Elementary, you just rebuilt it and it's full. Mm -hmm. With watershed there, more development coming in Jessup, um, and then the airport over there hasn't even been developed yet, and that's slated for development behind, right next to Monarch. Um, and Monarch is full and always is full. Chesapeake Science Point is full and always is full. And even though those are not yours, they're always full. Um, there's nowhere else for these kids to go. Um, you're gonna have to do something over there. I know it's not on your six year plan, but it really needs to be. What is the possibility of getting it on the six year plan? Because in West County, there really is nowhere for these kids to go. And with transportation the way it is, the likelihood of busing these kids elsewhere west of route three doesn't exist you can't get them on base like you said because the feasibility of that is non-existent there's nowhere else for these kids to go no i totally agree with you um you know we've been talking about this and and, and part of it is uh, you know the arundel gateway i mean they they did a lot of the infrastructure a number of years ago and that actually um it didn't develop as fast as probably anticipated however now they're building and Jim, Jim's probably got a real good idea on how fast they're selling. I think they've got what 400 units already sold. They have the ability to develop, I think it was 1800 homes. I'm, I'm again, Jim could probably correct me on that. Yeah, it's so it's 1810 roughly. Okay. And um, so for a long time, that's basically sat dormant. It is now activated. Um, it has certainly gotten our attention. You know, it's gotten my attention that we need to do something. Um, and we need to basically try to put that school in the six year plan. Uh, it takes a number of years from basically once we say, let's go build a school, it's basically five years. 
you know, when you start it to, to when you finish it. Uh, toughest thing we have is funding. It's, it's getting the money and to build an elementary school, it's 50, again, it's about $50 million. And can the county afford a $50 million school? And typically that affordability is a concern. And, um, but I think the, it's gotta be addressed. Um, and it's something that's gonna come up. Great, great. But, uh, that but at the same time, you have to understand as far as uh, capacity, like we get state participation. If there's available seats adjacent, the state doesn't participate. So say if I have a 200 seats at these adjacent schools, they're gonna discount 200 seats because I could redistrict. And, and if I look at the overall need um, feeder, and I just happen to have it here uh, in elementary school, um, I have a state rated capacity of 6366 for elementary school. And my highest projection is only 5600. So technically, I have capacity in that area, at least in, in the next 10 years. It's not going to be, you know, it may be on base, it may be at the different schools, but right now there is capacity um, in this region. And it's because we've, we've, we're doing additions. I'm doing, you know, additions at Maryland, we did one in Maryland City, we're doing one at Brockbridge. So we are adding capacity. Val? Thank you. I was just curious about the creative solutions that some other counties like Howard and Montgomery are considering with a hybrid model of remote learning and resolving some of these issues where some of the students are coming in Mondays, Wednesdays, and other students are coming in Tuesdays, Thursdays to alleviate the uh, lack of seats. And if there's any, been any consideration given to the hybrid learning model. Um, we are currently the hybrid, well, not the hybrid, basically virtual uh, academy is, is going to continue as far as I know. Um, we only had 562 were enrolled um, as of September. However, that number dropped down to like under five, around 530. So some, some students actually dropped out, went back to regular, regular school. So uh, it's not a huge number. Um, but as far as any other kind of combinations, um, that has not been discussed. Uh, however, as everyone knows, we have a new superintendent coming in. Um, and, you know, who knows? So we'll see, see what um, the future holds. Well, excellent. Well, seeing no other hands raised, I will take my turn with this. And I just want to really emphasize what Nicole said. Um, and, you know, uh, Mr. Stewart, I know you're only the messenger, but I still want to say this in a public forum. So please take it with that. Um, I just really want to say that us in West County have been waiting for schools. People do not move to our part of the district and this county because of the schools, right? And as uh, Ms. Walsh Meadows rightly pointed out, there are other parts of this county that get new schools first, Severna Park, uh, Old Mill, Crofton, and really it goes to show it's where the money is at and the power is at. And we have been ignored far too long. And it's really inappropriate that I, I almost look at this as it's a Bermuda Triangle of decision-making and around, uh, the public schools, the council and the county executives for decades just keep pointing at each other saying who's to blame. And I get the point that you said it's $50 million to build a school. And that's an interesting talking point you're using, but I'm sorry, you're built Crofton, you've rebuilt Severna Park. All these other higher, wider, richer areas are getting the resources and this area is not. And I don't think there's any, uh, I think there's a correlation between the people that are there and the, the views that are there. But we as the part of West County deserve the same resources and we deserve the equity to ensure that our children in this area get the same resources of other areas. So that's one thing that I'm very passionate about. I've been on the Russet Community Association Board of Directors and worked uh, feverishly to try to get that land developed to, to deaf ears. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's a shame that that land is there. And it's really disheartening to hear you say that, well, it's not, this, it can't be done in six years. I mean, people are moving, people are not staying in the area if they have children. Uh, they, they just are leaving. And we're hearing from the Fort Meade and other areas that there's going to be an influx of, you know, that we just, we took a tour of Fort Meade and the public information officer said, there's going to be 5,000, 10,000 new people coming in and jobs with NSA and all that. 
but we're not building the infrastructure to support that. So we really need to have courage. And honestly, we're standing up in, in, in this group and in other community groups to say, we need resources here. So I hope you hear us loud and clear. I wanted to be on the record for this because um, I think it's important. And I get that this is a difficult balancing act, but it's about time that Western West County gets what they deserve. Well, just, uh, Mary, just, if Rachel, I may, just for the record, um, we have not ignored West County. I mean, Jessup was replaced, brand new school replaced Jessup in 2019, and it was $47 million. Pershing Hill was replaced in 2011, not that long ago. Um, we've done additions at, um, well, actually, Har Harmon's was replaced in 2007. It's not that old. You know, Meade's getting $125 million renovation. Um, we've done improvements. We did a $15 million HVAC renovation over at MacArthur. Uh, West Mead, we did some additions and renovations and spent $3 million. Um, Mead Heights is about to get a six classroom addition. Uh, the school's not that old. Interview just got renovated in 2019 for $34 million. So, you know, that's if you add those, just those few, I mean, we're talking about $270 million and just in your region too. So it's not like we've ignored region two. Um, there's been a lot of money spent over the past few years. And, um, you know, I think that, yes, it, you know, it still needs more. I mean, like you said there, you know, I've been hearing the same thing with the Ford about 10,000 jobs and, and there's a lot of people coming. You know, you guys are in this area that are very close to, you've got the DC area, you've got Baltimore. It's a great area for, you know, for people to live in, easy access for jobs. And we need to, you know, fortunately we do own land to build some schools over there, which is a really good thing because land is really hard to find over there. So I think it's a matter of just, you know, getting back, it's up to the elected officials to, to basically prioritize and get that done. I mean, that's how a lot of these jobs, jobs are done. And I mean, he, uh, Jonathan Boniface is there and he did a lot with the Crofton. I mean, it, it became political, you know, the, the will of the people. I mean, you guys, Jonathan can attest to it. I mean, you've got to get behind the politicians and it was a fight. John, Jonathan spent years fighting that, um, you know, we can only do what we can when we get the funds, um, but certainly, you know, we'll we'll work with you guys and do it. So, great. Um, I see Marilee came, and then Thomas. I know you raised your hand too. So, Marilee first. Uh, how can you get the fort to participate in schools? I know that the fort has eleven thousand units, and they don't have to dress APF, so they're filling up the schools, but not providing impact fees or, you know, additions or any kind of mitigation? Uh, well, it's kind of interesting. The, the 125 million that we have going into to, uh, Mead High School is actually 75% um, of that's funded by the Ford or federal government. Um, the, MacArthur actually was on the, ra on, on the list as well. Um, and the only reason those schools were even on the list was there was a schools, I don't know if it was Guam or one of these places, uh, it was condemned back, you know, I'm going to say it was 10 years ago and, and kids couldn't even learn. So the federal government undertook a study around the world of all the military bases to say, how bad are these schools? And um, Meade High School was listed real high up. And the problem we had at Meade was it was over $100 million. So they, the federal government said, well, that's nice, but we have all these little teeny dinky schools that we can do for, you know, a million dollars or a couple million dollars. So they basically took care of a lot of that before they even got to uh, meet high school. So, um, so that's, a. I mean, as far as federal government, I wish they would participate a little bit more. Um, but, you know, we have gotten at least finally got something out of, out of them to help us at least with one of the schools, which is, is something. Um, it took a long time. Uh, they almost didn't give us funding for it because only a third of the students at the high school level actually attend meet high school. Uh, they actually had to change federal law because it used to say 50 percent um, so it took a few years for them to change the legislation so we could even qualify for funding um, and then we got into a little little problem because we had our, by then we had already invested about 27 million dollars into the school and they were like well you can tear it down but then you can't well you can't use your your prior uh, funds that we invested in the school. So then we would have had to come up with another 25 million. So we kind of 
ended up doing the, basically a major renovation for the school. So it's, um, but MacArthur's on the list. Um, I don't know when they're gonna finally uh, come to us and say that, you know, the money's available. Uh, it, took, it took probably eight years to get the Mead High School one out of the gate. So MacArthur, I'm sure it's gonna take a little while too. Great, Thomas. Hi, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. I, I was wondering. I didn't get. I wasn't fully clear on the answer about impact fees and such. But when um, I was curious to know when the county collects impact fees to offset the impact of uh, new residents to schools, are those funds generally collected and spent in the area in which they're collected, or do they go to a greater pool? across the uh, entire county. And I wonder the same about uh, about traffic impact fees and such too, because you know, with all these positions going to the East Campus and all this growth, just intuitively, I think, yeah, let, let the housing occur around it to take pressure off the infrastructure. That obviously increases infrastructure in schools and such, and I get that. But with new homes being built, being offset with impact fees, won't that, or, or will it? I, I honestly don't know. Will those fees be kept in or around Region Two to offset that impact? Yeah, they're all based on the region they're they're spending. Now that's part of the impact fee discussion is whether or not instead of having say seven different districts, should it be you know four districts or one district? Um, and certainly that's something that we've talked about um, because, like you said, uh, you know if there's a lot of money collected, uh, the tough thing is depending on the age, you know, cause certainly as, as the county developed, um, we've got areas that are older that, you know, we've got schools that date back, you know, back from the fifties. Um, and now all of a sudden you have all this development and where we just built new schools. So maybe you don't need the impact fee there, but you could use it over at the other side. And, and um, but right now it's, it's really based on region. So, and I think transportation set up the same way and a gym, gym pays all the impact fees. So we probably could, attest to some of that. All right, Jim, it looks like, I don't think we have any questions, so we'll wrap up with you if, if you have a question or comment. I just had one follow-up question. Um, it was great news to hear that uh, the federal government kicked in some money to all that work over at Mead. I was just curious, um, I, I don't know a ton about that project, if it, if it uh, added many classrooms or you know what the focus of the investment was on that project. Um, it, the capacity is not going to go up much, Jim, on that. Um, a lot of it is just a wholesale redo of the school. Um, you know, there's additions to, you know, everything from cafeterias to auditoriums, redoing all, you know, all the classrooms and stuff. But uh, currently the SRC that you see in the um, latest master plan, that, that includes the current project, you know, I think it's like 20, I'm gonna say 2,500 or so. So that is the current SRC. Um, the tough thing from a development perspective as Jim always pays attention to is uh, the high school level um, showing out to, and again, I'm gonna say my current projections are showing it up to uh, almost 3,000 students. So it's gonna be over capacity, you know, roughly by 500. Hence the whole discussion with the redistricting. So part of the redistricting is, you know, having to look um, to move, basically move students and balance that. Um, and if some of you saw council just last night approved, um, actually, I guess it was Monday, Tuesday night, whatever it was, um, the Severn Danza property, um, you know, we're looking at that for a secondary high school. And part of the reason for that is there's so much growth at the high school level, even with the addition of the Old Mill West, um, we believe we're still gonna be short seats. And um, so, you know, we know we need to look at that um, and that's kind of just what, you know, kind of west of, or I'm sorry, east of um, your region, but that would help balance it. It's just almost just outside your region at the intersection of 174 and, and 170. So that's something that, you know, down the road, again, it may be 15 years, it could be 10 to 15 years from now, but that's something we, we're looking at because we know there's still gonna be a shortage of uh, seats in the high school level. Well, excellent. Well, thank you, Mr. Stewart, for your time. I know we went a little over, but I, I had a feeling that the presentation from the public schools would go that way. So I'm sure we'll get back on track with timing, but thank you very much for your time, and I will turn it over to Mark. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gregor. 
Uh, so next up, we have Jonathan Boniface from the Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation. Good evening, everybody. Let me uh, switch over to my screen here and share it. Okay. Uh, my name is Jonathan Boniface. I'm the research manager for Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation. Uh, or AAEDC for short. Um, we provide financing, technical assistance, regulatory guidance, uh, and more to assist businesses um, of all sectors and sizes so they can focus on uh, their core mission, which is and business growth. Um, we're a quasi-governmental nonprofit organization uh, focused on economic development in the uh, county. And I wanna thank you for giving me this opportunity to present tonight. Uh, using the most recent Census Bureau's origin destination employment statistics and the local employment dynamics data, uh, data in 2019, uh, which is the most recent data, uh, Region 2 was home to about 29,540 uh, primary jobs. And this doesn't include the sensitive government jobs located uh, in and around uh, Fort Meade. By examining the commuter flows, we see that 96% of those working at jobs in Region 2 commute in from the outside of Region 2 uh, or their boundaries, and only about 3.6% live within the actual boundaries of Region 2. So that just basically means 94% of those employed residents in your region uh, work outside your region. The highest concentrations of uh, Region 2 residents' uh, jobs are located in the Washington, D.C. and Baltimore City area, um, as well as uh, or followed by Columbia. Um, this is mainly due to Region 2 being located along I-95 and in between, uh, pretty much directly in between Washington and Baltimore. And of those 16,865 uh, employed residents of Region 2, we see that 12.9% earn less than $15,000 per year. 23.5% uh, earn between 15 and 40,000 per year, while almost two thirds make over 40,000 per year. And here are the statistics for those making less than 15,000. Uh, we see the largest uh, categories are those under 30 years old and those uh, that work in the retail trade and the accommodation and food services industries. Looking at the statistics for those making between 15,000 and 40,000, uh, we see that the largest category um, by age shifts to those between 30 and 54, and those working in the healthcare and social assistance and retail trade industries, um, and also uh, accommodation and food service, which is your hotel and restaurants. For those making over $40,000 a year, uh, nearly two thirds are between 30 and 54 years old, and the predominant industries are professional, scientific, and technical services, uh, followed closely by uh, public administration, and then health and uh, social healthcare and social assistance. Now, so where do that? Uh, where do where are the 29,540 primary jobs in Region Two located? Well, if you look at the map here, and this. Like I said before, this doesn't include the Fort Meade uh, jobs that are sensitive and not included in the data. But the highest concentrations um, obviously would be Fort Meade if you included those, but also uh, MVP and around Arundel Mills. And uh, MVP, in case I'm sure everybody knows, but that's National Business Park. A lot of office buildings over there that support the fort. Looking at where uh, those working in Region 2 are commuting in from, uh, we see that many are coming from Baltimore City, uh, from Howard County, and nearby towns in Anne Arundel County. Um, again, this doesn't include all those people commuting to the fort um, that aren't included in this data. Now, examining the jobs by their North American Industry Classification uh, System, or NAICS codes, uh, we see that the professional, scientific, and technical services uh, is the most dominant industry for employment um, with high concentrations of the uh, National Business Park and Arundel Preserve, followed by uh, accommodation and food services, uh, which includes those many hotels and restaurants, uh, especially around the, uh, the Arundel Mills area.
Now, looking at the last 10 years of, uh, of growth for those top five industries, we see that job growth in these industries is especially high in the professional, scientific, and technical services, and also the uh, accommodation and food services industries. Both more than doubled from 2010 to 2019. On the next couple slides, we examine the demographics of those working at jobs in Region 2. Um, here we break it down by earnings, age, and sex. Next, we break it down by race, ethnicity, and educational attainment. Now, looking at the commercial real estate market, uh, we used uh, CoStar to pull the real estate data. We see that uh, Region 2 has a strong commercial real estate market with 379 properties uh, with over 10 million uh, square feet of space. Now, the retail uh, market consists of 104 properties and uh, is concentrated mainly in the Maryland City area and the Arundel Mills. Uh, the vacancy rate there is uh, at 4.7% is uh, far lower than the or is lower than the county average of 5.2% um, for vacant available, available retail space. Now office space in this uh, region is mainly located around National Business Park um, and up through Arundel Preserve. The 8.3% vacancy rate is right on uh, the same average as that is in the county, which is 8.3% as well. The industrial market has a higher vacancy rate at 3.2% than the county as a whole, which is at 1.9%. As you can see on this map, the predominant location uh, for the industrial space is up uh, on the border with Howard County and along the, uh, the major routes uh, of 295. Flex space, which is a, a combination of uh, retail and office in the front, a warehouse in the back, um, is a little scarcer in region two, uh, which may account for why the uh, vacancy rate at 1.6% is uh, far lower than the 6.6% in the rest of the county. Region two is also home to one of the many uh, commercial revitalization districts uh, that we have within Anne Arundel County. Uh, properties in this special district uh, can qualify for certain tax incentives. And also the uh, Arundel Community Reinvestment Fund, uh, which we call ACR here. Uh, there are loans up to uh, $50,000 uh, that can be repaid over three to seven years uh, with zero interest. Um, if you have any interest in those kind of things, uh, you know, definitely, uh, point people our way, uh, business owners. Um, now let's look at some of the uh, economic drivers in Region 2. Uh, of course, Fort Meade, um, it's uh, one of the biggest, or it is the largest employer in the state of Maryland, and is home to over 121 uh, organizations, including the National Security Agency, U.S. Cyber Command, and the uh, Defense Information Systems Agency, uh, and so many more. There are almost uh, 68,000 uh, jobs located at the fort, at the fort, and uh, the majority are civilian uh, government employees, followed by military uh, and contractors. Live Hotel and Casino uh, states that it's the number one tourist de destination in Maryland, and it employ employs approximately 3,000 workers, uh, making it another major economic uh, driver for not only uh, Anne Arundel County, your region, but the whole state. And there's also the three mile zone around there where a lot of uh, dollars from the uh, video lottery terminals uh, go to the local, uh, local development council. And it's uh, divvied up within that three mile zone. Rundle Mills uh, and the surrounding businesses employ approximately 10,000 workers. Uh, the Rundle Mills Mall itself has over 220 specialty stores, uh, 17 anchors. Um, Laurel Park uh, has uh, made many changes or has many changes that are being proposed uh, for the coming years. The demolition and replacement of the existing grandstands uh, is a big one, um, as well as uh, the building of a mark station, a uh, rail station nearby that will serve uh, both your community um, and the racetrack. And that is my presentation. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions uh, that you may have. Great, Nicole Walsh Meadows has a question. Um, 198 has been um, 
kind of vacant off and on that corridor marketplace has kind of been the vein of the existence of a lot of residents of the russet community for quite some time and i know the owners of the corridor marketplace are not the best uh to work with from what the business owners tell us um we have met with the AE, AAE, DC, you guys. Um, previously, there was a lovely lady that came to the Russet board and met with us in the residence previously. Um, but what are you guys doing to kind of redevelop that? The, the former Total Wine store remains vacant. Um, the big lots came and people were not spectacularly happy that it was a big lots that came in there. That's not the kind of store we were looking to have. Um, so what are you guys doing to promote that um, with the renovations that Mr. Thompson is doing to the racetrack and what have you? You know, we really need some revitalization of that corridor marketplace. The Aldi's is great. Um, but, you know, we really need some revitalization, you know, there, another Dollar Tree came to where P1 left. And again, that's not the kind of store that needed to go in there in the plaza with, you know, the next plaza down. So we really need some attention paid to those strip malls over there. And we never seem to get it from you guys. You know, that lovely lady came and she said they were going to some, um, show in Las Vegas to talk about it and blah, blah, blah. And then we never heard from her for like five years. You're the next person that we've heard from. Well, I mean, it, it's hard. It's, uh, you know, that's a commercial revitalization district. So hopefully some of those business owners can try to spruce the place up, make it look a little better by getting the no interest loans, um, you know, getting the tax credits. Um, but as an economic development organization, we can't force a business to move in there and we just have to just, you know, go out there and we do, we go to ICSC out there and, and say, hey, look, we've got this area here. This is a great area. You should come check it out. But we can't tell them, oh, you have to come here. It's a business. Um, so we just, we try to make it as attractive as possible. And hopefully somebody will go there, but business kind of leads business. And, you know, we get out there and, you know, market it as best we can. But like I said, you know, the business has to choose to to go there. Um, anything, anything further, I can put you in touch with the vice president of our business development uh, team, who can you know go into depth of exactly what steps they've taken on that team to do that. Yeah, we just don't feel like things are actually being done. We get a lot of lip service, but we really don't see the fruits of these labors, and we really just don't feel like anything is being done. To be perfectly honest, to be blunt with you, I really just yeah. don't feel like, and the residents that I'm sure they can all um, say what they would like, but I really just don't see the fruits of this labor. We don't see anything being done. Things sit vacant forever and what have you. Yeah, and we, I mean, we do push, you know, behind the scenes, we push and try to get people there when people ask about space. And a lot of uh, what we do mainly is help new businesses get started. Um, we've started an inclusive ventures program to actually get um, a lot of uh, minority business leaders to kind of, or people in business to help them grow their business and, and kind of coach them along and give them a mentorship, uh, some seed money to, to move into these areas and expand. And, you know, we're hoping those kind of efforts are gonna push and, uh, and hopefully uh, bear fruits. Great, all right, let's go with uh, Jim next. Jim? Um, I just had a quick question. I thought your presentation was very informative. I was wondering if it'd be possible to share with the group. I was trying to jot down some of the notes as quickly as I could. We will provide all of the presentations for tonight in the Google Drive um, by tomorrow. Thanks. And, and I typed out everything I said, so but didn't go with the slides. I can send that over too. Thanks. I, I know I speak very quickly. So. I was used to testifying at the Board of Ed for a school <laughs> for many, many years. So I had two minutes to do it, so. All right, Mark. Um, yeah, Jonathan, I, I agree um, with Jim. Thank you for that presentation. It was very informative. Um, I think what would be helpful is also to see um, just sort of, uh, if you could somehow, um, a lot of the data um, compared to the countywide to give a point of reference because my my gut says that um, 
our our region has a, a very very large portion of the county's jobs but i would love to see the data behind that um if that's possible and just yep. kind of an overall comparison of of a lot of the statistics just to put it in perspective thank yeah, you all that i mean i pulled that all off of the census bureau website um but yes i mean pulling the county data is actually a lot easier than pulling it for a certain region. Uh, so yeah, we could definitely uh, pull that together. Great, any other comments from SAC members? I, I have one, but I wanted to be the last. Okay, if not, yeah, I just want to make the point. I, I everything that Nicole said, I, I was also an elected leader in, in the Russic community and surrounding areas. and. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you. That was over a decade ago that I was there. We had these same issues looking for that. Um, I think that helps keep some of the un undesirable pieces out. Um, but I also think that our area is often overlooked. There are really high paying jobs and there are really, you know, it's not a cheap place to live and people because our district two is so well situated between Baltimore, DC has close to BWI all these pieces. You know there are really great economic drivers here too so we should really be investing in this area because it's probably going to explode um and then my final question for you is how will your figures and thoughts adjust given the pandemic i mean i know for one i used to take the mark train every day for 15 years straight now i've taken the mark train 10 times in the past two years and i've been working from home how is that going to impact and how are you guys looking to change that as people have honestly move to a remote or a hybrid environment? Well, well, the biggest impact on businesses that we've seen uh, from the pandemic is the workforce. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've been working with our sister organization, the uh, Anne Arundel County Workforce Development Corporation, or AAWDC, um, to try to find businesses workers, because, you know, right now we're seeing it actually, it's a problem nationwide where yeah. you have all these job openings and you have an unemployment rate that Currently in our county, it's down in the three point, I think it's 3.6% in February. And you have all these openings, but nobody to work them. So, you know, there, there are a lot of businesses, especially in my area, I'm in West County and I go into some of these businesses and I see the owners actually working shifts because they don't have enough workers. And they're like, where can we get workers? And, and you're right. I mean, your area is ripe for expansion. And um, I mean, my, my personal idea is throw a high school in there and you know, you're, you're gonna have a absolutely, I mean, your, your whole entire area would boom. Um, it's a big economic driver. Um, I know I saw it for my area, we didn't have one, you know, for 50 years we were fighting. And I mean, I personally fought for eight years for a high school. Um, our kids were going to South County and Arundel and uh, you know, or you know, South River and Arundel and they were split in two. We finally got a high school and it's, and if you come down to the Crofton area, Gambrels, um, that whole area is just booming. Um, and part, partly uh, because of the high school. So, um, I, I, you know, a point to make, and I'm making it on behalf of one of our uh, SAC members of a comment she made. So maybe, maybe she'll chime up, but I'm not, I won't force her to. But I, I know, you know, a lot of this is because of affordability, right? So I, when you, I'm talking about the worker piece. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not affordable to live in our area. Um, you know, one bedroom apartments can jump up to $2,100 a month. So it's really hard to tell people, hey, go work at, um, you know, at the mall working a retail position for $15, $20 an hour, but you have an incredibly high, you know, cost of living here. So I think we need to, you know, we as a, as a uh, SAC need to think about ways that we can think about how can we zone more affordable housing and other ways to bring down costs so that way we can have younger people and people that are doing those service jobs. Um, matter of fact, the other night, uh, it was my wife's and I anniversary, we went to the Cheesecake Factory in, um, at the mall. And we made a reservation for 7 p.m. And we didn't get sat until 7.45 because there was no staff and half the restaurant was empty. So, you know, and I, I guarantee you they're making good money there, you know, but it's just, that's just a problem. And the hard part is people aren't coming back to those traditional jobs, especially if they can't afford it. So I think that that's something important. And I know it's something we've talked about as SAC members about the importance of how affordability will help unlock a lot of these pieces. 
Exactly. And like I said, that's where, you know, we're seeing a lot of job openings. You know, when we say there's 10,000 jobs at Arundel Mills, you know, that mall in that area, um, a lot of those aren't filled right now. So, you know, it's, you go into a lot of stores and it's not, not just the cheesecake factory, but a lot of those restaurants, they're just, they're hurting for people. So, yeah. and workforce development, I mean, that's, they're, they're trying to fill them as fast as possible. And quick question for you too, and if you don't know, it's totally fine. Do you know approximately, pre-pandemic, how many people would visit Arundel Mills a year? I, I remember hearing it was something around the lines like 10 million a year. It's like, it's, I know it's one of the largest tourist malls in the country, but does that sound familiar? Yeah, it's, it's not, I know it's the largest uh, mall. It's like a super center for malls uh, yeah. in all of Anne Arundel County and in, for most of this region. Uh, but yeah. I don't know the exact figures. I haven't seen anything recent. Uh, the yeah, things I'm sure I saw, the pandemic's good. Yeah, Dude. before the pandemic, they were by far the number one. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, sir. Really appreciate yeah. your time. Um, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mark for our next presentation. Uh, before that, I will say, we do have two more groups to go. So I think in lieu of a break, if we, if it's okay, if we can power through and then we'll take a break and then we'll do our driving tour debrief. So hold on there. I mean, of course, if you need to leave and go, go ahead, but hopefully if you can hang on for two more presentations. So Mark, turn it over to you. Sure, great. Thank you again. Um, so from Anne Arundel County Public Libraries, we have uh, Rudy Riddell. Would you like me to share the presentation or do you have it up, Rudy? Uh, I've got it up right here. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so good evening. I'm Rudy Rodella. I'm the library's chief technology officer, and I'm presenting uh, the library's portion in uh, Anne Arundel 2040. So let me share my screen. Again, everyone can see that okay? Okay. Uh, so here is a snapshot of the open scale of the library as one of the county's business uh, units. Let me get this, I'm sorry. There we are. Uh, so for the most recent complete fiscal year, our budget was $28.1 million, 24.5 of that uh, funded by the county. So we're a fairly healthy, uh, you know, small, small to medium sized business, but in the scope of the county's overall efforts, we're pretty small potatoes but we do have a lot of bang for our buck. Uh, for me, the big takeaway is our per capita spending amount. Uh, for just under $4 per person per month, Anne Arundel County residents can enjoy access to over 750,000 books, DVDs, audiobooks on CD, free Wi-Fi in our buildings and on our campuses, educational programs, streaming movies and music, millions of magazine articles, and the list just goes on and on. And it's also a safe place just to hang out. A pretty good bargain in my book. We operate 16 libraries throughout the county. 15 of those are owned by the county. And we have one uh, in a rented space, in a commercial rented space. So the map here that's on the screen shows our census block groups throughout the county, which are the smaller constituents of census tracts. And they're shaded by population density. The, more, the darker the shading, the more densely populated it is. So overall, we are in fairly good shape facility, facility location wise. Our libraries are where they need to be, but with one exception. Region three is significantly underserved, but we do have a plan expansion in that area that's in the capital improvement plan for FY28. All these services are guided by our strategy 2023, which we developed in October of uh, 2018. Our vision, the way we see Anne Arundel County as a welcoming, resilient community where all can realize life to its fullest potential. And to make that vision a reality, our purpose, or what we used to call our mission, what we're charged to do is educate, enrich, and inspire. So the current strategy asks us to focus on these five areas. Now we, by which I mean uh, library leadership and staff at all levels, we've been gratified to work with through under this new strategy model because these focus areas are actually interrelated. They aren't siloed efforts. For example, a focus on better access, tailored services and effective partnerships was instrumental in our rapid 
flexible, and creative approach to service during the pandemic. Libraries became distribution points for test kits and masks. To date, we've distributed 126,000 test kits and 259,000 masks. We also partnered partnered with County Health and other agencies to provide vaccine clinics at 14 of our libraries. And through our philanthropic partners, we expanded our Wi-Fi hotspot kits, providing internet access to bridge the still persistent digital divide. Now, we don't do it all, but we do connect it all. In the lower right, you see last July's ribbon cutting for the community pantry at Discoveries, our outlet in Westfield Annapolis Mall. They collect donations of diapers, baby wipes, and other hygiene items to distribute to families. Families don't need to show need, and it gives us the opportunity to cross-promote library services. All this demonstrates the vital, irreplaceable role of public libraries as social infrastructure. So this is a, a concept articulated by Eric Kleinenberg, a social, uh, sociologist at NYU, in his book, Palaces of the People. This is not a European social style safety net, but a unique framing of the need for common non-commercial spaces that support and encourage community bonding. People need a safe place to be with each other, to make friends, to create the channels and structures to watch out for each other, to take care of each other. All of that, the connective tissue that makes for a resilient, vital, safe and future-proof community. The library is all this plus more. People and place magically create this platform for all these aspects of community building and interaction. So getting down to the brass tacks about how libraries serve Region 2. We have three libraries that serve Region 2, although only one of them, uh, Maryland City at Russet, is actually on Region 2 turf. The shading on this map shows the service areas for the Maryland City, Severn, and Odenton libraries. Now, in our context, service areas are self-selected by library customers, and they're, they're based on census block groups. They show which library the majority of people who live in that area, um, they show which library the majority of people in that block area prefer to use. The library's facilities master plan, and also in Anne Arundel 2040, set a goal to provide 0.5 square feet of library space per capita throughout the county overall. For the libraries serving Region 2, we meet this goal with 0.52 square feet per capita of library space. There is one wrinkle though, the Severn Library is under provisioned, but it's also landlocked so we can't expand it uh, in its current location. Now we do have a planned revision of the facilities master plan that we're, going to, that we're going to undertake in the next fiscal year. It's probable, maybe even likely, that we'll get a recommendation to add a new library, perhaps in the area around Arundel Mills Mall. Now, our service model also gives us the flexibility to provide services in commercial spaces. So we're not limited to only purchasing and buying. We're not, we're not limited to the build by own model of uh, of libraries. One other note, the Maryland City Library was listed in poor condition in the facilities master plan, uh, mostly due to its interior finishes and layout. But the good news is that we do have a plan renovation that will be starting in May of this year to address some of these concerns. For a deep dive into the full text of our strategy, the facilities master plan and our community impact reports, they're available on this website and also to explore this concept of the library as social infrastructure. I do recommend these, uh, this podcast from 99% Invisible and this seminar with Eric Kleinenberg at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And these are gonna be on the slides which will be provided for you uh, tomorrow. Uh, with that, that is my presentation and I'm ready to take any questions you may have. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, folks could please use the raise hand function. Do you have any questions or comments? All right. Well, I'll wait just I have a question. Oh. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, Carrie. sorry. No, I'll let Mark go. I see Mark raise his hand. <laughs>
No, thanks. I, I just had a question about um, is is there anything at the Russet Library that we should um, be aware of uh, relative to to this regional plan? Um, I don't know what that might be, but because I just don't know enough about it. But. Sure. So in all candor, we are taking a very close look at the service that we provide at Russet. Um, I can scroll back to the one of the earlier slides of, I don't know if you remember seeing it, that um, on the overall county plan, uh, because libraries in Maryland do have a uh, mutual uh, support agreement, if you have an Anne Arundel County Public Library card, you can also get a public library card at any library throughout Maryland. Uh, we pay close attention to where our neighbors position their libraries as well. Uh, Prince George's County opened a brand new, very beautiful library at the uh, Laurel. And we are we are certain it's drawing a lot of our customers over to that library, which is okay. We, as long as people are going to a library, that's what we want to uh, help and support. So we're going to take a close look at, at the services uh, at Russet. And again, we have a facilities master plan redo coming next year. So this is gonna be one of the items that they will look at, perhaps modeling that library through, toward a particular focus. Um, for instance, some libraries throughout the nationwide do provide uh, a focus on technology or a focus on um, public administration or a focus on uh, uh, employment opportunities and providing uh, connections with uh, job fairs and things like that. Uh, so we're looking at that as well. The other thing that we're also going to look at in the new facilities master plan is a concept that we're calling um, just right now we're referring to it as a extreme library makeover plan where we're able to invest one to two million dollars per library to give that 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 new refreshed look that uh, and also refinish all the surfaces update the uh, technology that's inside that to bring those services those libraries back up to uh, 21st century standards Well, great. Well, um, I just wanted to thank you. I love the libraries. They do a great job. And uh, in my day job, I uh, represent an organization for older adults. And I think it's really important that we have these infrastructure. Um, I know we all kind of assume that everybody has a you know computer in their hand uh, and can do all that stuff. But for a lot of our older adults, that's still not the case. And they rely on libraries for a lot of very critical information. So thank you for all the, the services you provide. Thank you. Those are Great, all right, so I'll turn it over to Mark um, for our next set of presenters. Mark? Great, so next up is Graham Lang with police. Good evening, members. I'm just gonna activate my video just for a few moments to so you can see that I am a real person and not just a uh, wallpaper. I'm gonna turn it back off because it distracts me and I'll continually look at it. So here I am. Let me share my screen. Uh, all right, uh, again, I'm Graham Lange with the police department. I'm the strategic planner, uh, planner analyst. Uh, my primary objective for the, for the chief and command staff is to focus on analyzing the strategic staffing needs of the department, but I also do a lot of administrative research, um, kind of a duties as assigned um, kind of mentality. I thought I, at the last minute before the uh, meeting started, I decided to add uh, a post map. This, this area in colorized area is Western District. And I did my best to do a little polygon around uh, region two. Um, so it uh, completely falls in, in Western district. My presentation is a little bit different than the other presenters. I tried to one, answer the healthy community uh, goals um, and just kind of respond to those uh, is where I directed it to. So. The first one in regards to community policing, I again did my best to to address those those goals and uh, wanted to just 
call out traffic enforcement. So uh, for 2020, 2021, um, those are the figures. Uh, 2020 obviously was a little less because of COVID and fewer people on the highways. And that would be a reasonable explanation on why uh, activity and crashes were down for 2020. The next one, average response time has been pretty consistent. So for a priority one call, which involves a crime in progress or and or a uh, potential loss of life uh, is a priority one call where um, officers and supervisors have to, somebody has to respond to the call. There is no uh, holding the call or delaying the call for a response. And in 2021, there were 1300 roughly responses that were qualified. So that's from the time the call taker on the phone says, ma'am or sir, uh, the officers on the way to the first officer arriving on the scene. And on average, it's four minutes. The police department, everything's geared towards plan 2040, but the police department operates uh, on a yearly, on a 12 month period and reassesses every year. So. Um, at the end of this, I'll show you how to find this link. You don't have to copy it down. It's very simple to find, but the uh, department annual report is, is out there. And each of the goals and objectives of the chief are um, kind of outlined to what the department did towards those. Um, this uh, Health and Communities 10-1B uh, essentially address staffing. So I decided to give you a snapshot of what staffing is like for the police department currently. We're currently authorized 782, but we really need 893. And how that number came about is that I categorically went unit by unit and inquired with the units to what what do you need? And if if a supervisor or commander responded and said, I would like to have, I told them no, that is, you cannot want to have anything. I need, to, I need to understand, and taxpayers need to understand what you have to have to be fully operational to effectively deliver law enforcement services to the citizens and visitors to Anne Arundel County. And that's how I, that's kind of the, the crux of that, that number. So, um, but every month, on average, we have 32 officers that are not able to carry out law enforcement du duties due to medical reasons, whether they were injured on the on the job or had, had some other health issue that arose after. But this 32 only reflects uh, individuals who were 30 or more consecutive days not available to do police work. So I, this does not include someone who has a cold or um, is out for a week. This is 30 days or more consecutive days. Along with the same methodology is military deployment. So at any given time, we have roughly five officers who are detached to the military on deployment. Every year since 2013, the average separation of the department, whether it's resigned voluntarily, retirement, or et cetera, we're losing 52 officers uh, every fiscal year, measuring from July 1st to September 30th of the following year. This year right now, we already have lost 40 and we're in April. So I don't have any projected retirements between now and June 30th, um, but on average, we're losing, losing or at least uh, four officers are separating uh, on average each month. So if you were to subtract our operational needs minus what we're currently allocated by uh, the county, we're 200 positions short um, of what we, we need or what I, essentially my analysis shows we need to, again, my little flowery statement, effectively deliver law enforcement services to the citizens and visitors of Anne Arundel County. 
as of today, oh, pardon me, as of today, we have 776 officers in filled positions. That includes officers that are in the academy. Those officers in the academy are, no, are not uh, operational, able to do police work for 12 months after they're hired. So just to put that in context, um, there's six vacancies uh, right now. And sorry, again, I'm, I'm trying to just call out the bottom line of the of the uh, screen, but right now we have 179 police officers that are either have 20 years of service and eligible retire uh, due to service retirement, or they are and or they are 50 years and older with five years of service. And those those usually the five years of service over age 50 uh, has to do with uh, officers that retired from another police department and came to this department. Um, infrastructure as it pertains to Region 2 Western District, um, the building is facility is 30 years old and it's coming to the end of its life cycle essentially. So it's on radar to um, be renovated or updated in the future. Um, with the other projects uh, that the department has right now, we're uh, interested in consolidating, updating the forensic services or the crime lab with the um, property unit, which holds evidence and found property and all is uh, undersized because since it was built, and I apologize, I don't have the date that the, the um, storage unit was was built uh, laws have changed and requires us to retain and hold on to property and evidence a lot longer than we than we had when it was built um 10 1 f uh, talks about providing uh warming and cooling centers each of the four districts uh is available during heat uh heat and uh cold times of years as a warming center for those who need the cert, need the, need somewhere to go the uh, lobby or uh, the community room at each of the four districts is available for that purpose uh, 10.2 addressed uh, training needs uh, police personnel are, are, have, are trained through either training division or as a primary source of training and uh, annual in-service training or online courses through the National Incident, Ma Incident Management System. Um, each year, the police department seeks to increase staffing. And as I told you, we're from my analysis, we're 200 sworn positions short of where we, we need to be. Um, but it appears that this year, we will maybe get a couple of officers. So I, I can't say what that is because the county executive hasn't, uh, as my understanding, hasn't finalized the um, the budget for county departments. Um, one of the members had asked a question through the uh, organizers for this presentation about. Um, What's what is the police department doing in in the regard in the 198 Laurel area? Um, and I I can assure you that every day the c command staff from the chief to the district commanders meet either in person or in conference calls to discuss what's going on around the the department me around the county and how they can maximize the deployment of officers uh, that they have available. And a lot of that 200 positions being short is, is backfilled with overtime um, to try to do, our, do the department's best to meet the needs of the, the community. One other thing that the uh, chief, uh, this chief has expanded would, uh, was adding additional uh, police and community together packed officers and Western District has four officers and they are assigned to directly at, attend community meeting, community events, and um, 
provide crime prevention, um, et cetera. Um, on this page here, all this can be found on the county website, uh, the annual report. It's um, the information for the Western District Police Station, uh, which would have contacts to the, the district commander. Um, one of the things that has been going, that uh, one program that's been going on is the Police Community Relations uh, Council for the last 56 years, they meet once a month. Um, and in this case for Western District, they meet every, uh, the second Wednesday every month at 7 p.m. So I would request that if any of the members or the, uh, the group of members are interested in specifics of, I would call it tactical or operational um, strategies of, of Western District, that, that is where you go to, to um, inquire and, and voice your concerns, et cetera. Um, just wanted to bring over, I think this is my, that's my last slide, very simple to find. If you just uh, do a search on Anne Arundel County Police Department, the first search is going to be our is going to be our website. Um, annual report is right here, and it's ninety nine pages. If you're interested in some light reading, um, also the services and programs. A little bit more information about the police. Uh, where are they? Police Community Relations Council. If you want to, you don't have to copy any, uh, jot any notes down. It's very simple. Just Anne Arundel County Police Department, and you can find all this information. Sorry about the little rough uh, presentation, but that's the end of it. So I guess I'll take some questions. Great. Um, I see uh, Nicole Walsh Meadows is our first question, or that's who you popped up first. So I'll let you go first, Nicole. Um, Western has always had the highest calls for service for the last um, 15 to 18 years that I was monitoring the crime stats for the various HOAs and security committees that I was a part of. I've been a PCRC member for that entire period of time. Um, when the chief's whatever study that was done when Goodwin was the commander at Western, um, it was recommended that the patrol areas be redistricted in Western for that very reason, because Western has the highest calls for service. The Adam two post goes from Laurel all the way up to Jessup, which you can never get to in morning or evening rush hour or what have you. We've been through three chiefs now, um, and that has yet to be done. Is there any talk of that being redone. I know you're 200 short. And if any of these officers, these 179 officers decided they want to retire tomorrow, you're going to be even more short. And with the police and community relations today, your recruiting efforts, um, you're not, you, you know, you're not going to get the folks that you were getting previously. Um, but is there any talk with this new chief who seems very lovely um, of getting these redistricted? Um, these patrol areas are, are not feasible. Um, you know, and any of the officers that work Western will tell you that they're not feasible um, for the volume of calls that Western gets, um, with the exception of maybe the David cars, but from the Charlie cars West, these, these patrol areas are not feasible for Western District anymore, especially given the development and the growth that Western District has. So thank you very much for asking that question because I, I meant to address that. So the um, Major Hassenpush is the commander for the Bureau of Patrol. And one of, one of the first things that he started doing was doing an analysis. And just like you said, the 295 is a choke point for officers uh, getting across there to help an officer or respond to a call on the west side of 295. And he's looking to, to uh, he's in the, not looking to, he's in the process of resizing, reorganizing, and maybe even splitting, splitting five atom two so that there's 
more help in the towards the five atom one area. So yes, I apologize for not not saying that. Thank you for calling that out. But yes, they are actively looking at redistricting or re, realigning that post so that it can be a little bit more effective to um, responses. Great. Um, now I'd like to go to uh, SAC Vice Chair Keisha Barrett. Keisha, you have a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Joe. So uh, my question is um, relating to the uh, heating and cooling stations that you mentioned about the homeless community. Uh, have you noted that that is that like sufficient space to accommodate them on those days when you know there's like a significant storm? Are they able to be accommodated and appropriately, I guess, in the facilities that you all have? I can only say that I have not heard anything to say that it was a problem that there was inadequate space. So I've never, I've never heard any, any of them talk about that. Okay. I say them, be, uh, meaning command staff in, mm -hmm. in meetings. I've never heard them say, oh, Western District was uh, packed and we had people in the lobby and out the doorway uh, that were there seeking to cool down or warm up. So I've never heard that. Thanks. Excellent. Well, without any other questions, I'll turn it back over to Mark because I believe we'll then roll into our fire presentation. Great. So again, thank you, Graham. And up next, we have Lauren Schultz. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, and do you have a presentation or do you just... Yeah, let me... Let me a few uh, items. Yeah, I'll wait for that other screen and let me see if I could pull... Hold this up. All right, everybody see that okay? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, awesome. Um, well, my name is Larry Schultz uh, and I am the Assistant Fire Chief of Operations uh, for the Anne Arundel County Fire Department uh, and I'm representing Chief Wolford uh, with this presentation. So uh, just, uh, I'll focus, um, most of my verbal verbal information on the region two uh, uh, pieces that that would likely be most important to the group. Uh, but just as an overall introduction, uh, your Anne Arundel County Fire Department uh, is uh, about twelve hundred people strong now. Uh, Nine hundred and fifty uh, of those people are career firefighters and paramedics, uh, with about three hundred being volunteers. Uh, we operate an all hazards agency. In other words, uh, not only do we do fire and EMS, but we have a robust uh, marine operations division, hazmat company, uh, technical rescue. We deal with uh, 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 terrorism and emergency management activities. So we, we truly are an all hazard agency. Uh, we operate out of 31 stations throughout the county. Uh, two of them will be specific to region two. And uh, overall, the department responds to about 90,000 plus calls uh, each year. Uh, and uh, that, that rate has continued to grow uh, in the county and has grown about 20% uh, over 10 years. Uh, of those 90,000 calls, <coughs> excuse me, uh, about 5,400 of those occurred in uh, Region 2. Uh, and in that area, we average about five minutes and 40, uh, 42 seconds uh, for an emergency response. And that's any type of, of emergency response, uh, fire or EMS, uh, our average response time from the time uh, that somebody calls 911 until the time we're at your door uh, is about five minutes and 42 seconds. Uh, we operate with over 65 engines uh, 16 ladder trucks, and uh, more than 34 uh, EMS transport units. And again, we have several fire boats uh, that deal with the uh, marine aspect of the department. Next slide. So specific to Region 2, we have two stations. Um, three, if you consider Fort Meade, we have a, a very robust mutual aid agreement with Fort Meade. Uh, they come off the base regularly. And, and uh, provide support to us, and we go on to the base uh, in a typical mutual aid agreement each day. 
The first station that, that is in your area is Station 27. That's located at 3498 uh, Fort Meade Road. Uh, that station has uh, two engines uh, and a medic unit, uh, as well as a BLS unit. Uh, there are five career firefighters on duty there every day, 24 hours a day, uh, and they provide primary staffing uh, for the engines and the medic unit. Uh, there are about 20 volunteers left on the roll, rolls at Station 27, and uh, when they're available, they'll come up and <coughs> excuse me, help with staffing um, either an extra engine or, or the BLS unit uh, in that area. The second station is Station 29 in Jessup, it's 7896 um, Max Blob Road. Uh, there is an engine, a ladder truck, and a medic unit in that station as well. There's five personnel assigned there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and uh, Station 29 in Jessup does not have uh, any volunteer members there uh, at all. Um, as far as what we're looking for facility-wise in the future, uh, we are excited uh, to finally begin the process of uh, rebuilding uh, Station 29 in Jessup. That facility is about 48 years old. Uh, the fire stations are the only uh, facilities in the county uh, that are occupied uh, full-time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, with a very, fairly large number of people. So these facilities, um, not only do they get used and, and, and really used pretty hard, uh, but as years go by, um, the requirements for fire stations uh, to deal with issues like carcinogenics um, from uh, apparatus emission, uh, the, the uh, other, other safety features, uh, that are that are uh, being built in fire stations now uh, just require so much more. So station 29 is is well overdue for uh, for a replacement. We're excited that we're going to get that started uh, in that in the FY 22 23 uh, year period where we we are working with Public Works now uh, to find land acquisition uh, to put station 29. <coughs> By FY24, uh, it's our hope that we'll begin uh, planning and engineering for the facility and uh, that at the latest by FY28, uh, we're ready to dig in and really begin to uh, rebuild that station. Um, the only other large projects, capital projects that the fire department has and they're not necessarily related to Region 2, but certainly supportive of, one is a replacement location for our training academy. Our training academy is uh, well over 40 years old, probably going on 50 now. And uh, we just really need uh, a training academy, which requires a lot of space uh, and will be a pretty hefty financial project. So uh, we're working with the county now to, to try to find a location that would be feasible for that. The second one is probably a longer capital project, and that's a partnership with uh, the police department uh, where, where we're looking to build a, a unified 911 center uh, so that our police and fire dispatchers are co-located uh, in a single facility. Again, kind of long-term plan uh, to go with that. Uh, so outside of that, that is really uh, the information that uh, affects region two. And uh, with that, I will stop sharing and answer any questions that anybody has. All right. So, Nicole, would you uh, see your hands up first? Um, you mentioned uh, Maryland City is um, five career staff and 20 volunteers in a BLS station. Um, Jessup, you said was five career staff, no volunteers. Is Jessup a BLS station as well? No, ma'am. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to stop sharing here. The screen's catching me a little. I'm sorry. Uh, so no, uh, uh, station 27, Maryland city, uh, is a full-time staff ALS unit as well as station 29 in Jessup, 
which also has a full-time staffed ALS unit or what you refer to as a medic unit. Okay. Both of those stations have medic units in them. And both of them have ALS capacity? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is there a reason that the response times are so high for five minutes and 42 seconds? Uh, five minutes and 42 seconds versus is, is an average uh, response time. Um, no particular reason that is not an excessively high response times. There are some er areas specific to region two, especially as you start to work on to the backside of Fort Meade, uh, that, that with the traffic uh, and some of the tra and some of the restrictions of going through the, the post to get there uh, take a little bit longer and those tend to drive the average. Uh, but but in and around the station uh, coming up into the russet green area for Maryland City uh, and and the uh, down towards Fort Meade from Jessup, uh, the response times get significantly lower as you, uh, move back in. It really is some of those outlying areas uh, that that may have um, some of those response times that get into the five minute. And remember, the five minute response time uh, I'm talking about from the time the 911 center picks up the phone until that resource is at your door. Most fire and EMS departments only count the time from the time the call is dispatched until the time. Uh, the, the first responder shows up at your door. So we're given a more uh, holistic view, which really ends up being your full experience, right? From the minute you call to the minute somebody arrives. Okay, last question. Um, yes, on the Laurel Racetrack Committee, um, I sat for a long time and we purchased many, many pieces of equipment for the Maryland City Fire Station. Um, and we were really upset that the county wasn't purchasing any of that. Um, will that no longer be necessary now that there's career staff there and what have you? Because that was very large expenses. We, you know, over several years, we purchased hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fire trucks, brush trucks, and what have you, that as a tax paying citizen, we felt the county should be paying um, for, not the racetrack funds. So will that no longer be necessary? So you, you, there, there's of our 31 stations, there's about nine of them that are owned by volunteers. And uh, up to this point, the volunteer uh, corporations have um, wanted to buy their own apparatus. Uh, they they uh, have, have chosen in the past to own it. Uh, and when they purchase it, the county still fuels it, the county maintains it, the county insures it. So there's always been that level of partnership. To get specific to your question, as uh, the, 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 the issue of volunteer firefighters in the nation is really at a crisis level. Uh, it, it is not just here, it's everywhere across the United States. And there's a, a, a million reasons uh, why people are volunteering less. Uh, but, but yes, to your, to your question, uh, as, more and more stations begin to see less of a volunteer membership and therefore have less of an ability to raise funds or do things that they've done in the past to purchase apparatus, the county would, would be taking over uh, the purchasing of that equipment. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Great, any other questions? Perfect, all right, well, Thank you, Mr. Schultz. I know uh, you had the distinct honor of being our last presentation, so you had to sit through a lot it, of others. It worked out. Yeah, right. No, very few questions. Everybody's ready to go. To yeah, exactly. No, but no, we no appreciate you. I appreciate the conversation that went on before, and it was very interesting to listen to. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you to all of the Anne Arundel County staff that joined us this evening. Um, this will end that part of the program. So you're of course welcome to stay, but I'm sure you also would, would like to get back to your evening. So, um, all right, so for our fellow SAC members, we, we have just one kind of piece uh, left, which I think is important, which is the driving tour debrief, especially since we had separate groups, I really kind of thought it'd be nice if we had a discussion. So uh, I guess, you know, the question is, would you all like to have a five minute break? I know you've been sitting or would you like to power through? 
Um, I know that it's been, you know, almost two and a half hours. So uh, what, what do folks think? Would, would you like a, a break or are, are you, do you feel like we can have a conversation? I'm fine either way. I'm okay. I think I just want to let's get it over with. That's my okay. Me too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. If anybody, of course, if you need to use a restroom or something, feel free. You know, feel free. We know you'll be right back. So, okay. Well, um, once again, I mean, I think this was the first time we had done having all of these groups. So maybe we kind of know in the future that maybe we have a little less so that way we're not here so late. So that's perfect. Um, so, Mark, do you want to just do a quick piece on kind of introducing the driving tour and then we can kind of have the discussion? Yeah, really, I, we just wanted to reserve some space for you all since this was since you all had gone out in two groups to share any impressions that you had um, from the driving tour. But I just do want to make one announcement that um, we'll be adding those points of interest from the driving tour as a unique uh, symbology on the feedback map. So we'll add the point just so that the rest of the public knows where all we had gone on the driving tour. And then if, if you all want to go back and sort of backfill and add any comments then um, from, again, your impressions or the reason why you wanted to include that points, point of interest on the map, um, feel free to do that. So hopefully we can get that up in the next uh, couple days. So um, again, just wanted to make that announcement and then just open it up, Joe, if you want to um, get the conversation going with everyone. Great. Well, it looks like Keisha has some thoughts. So Keisha, why don't you get us kicked off here? Oh, we still got you muted. You didn't quite get off mute yet. Sorry. There you go. Now, now we can hear you. You're good. You're good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just wanted to say I did appreciate the tour and getting a chance to see the places in person. Uh, one thing that I definitely took away from the tour, though, I had never been to the regional stations within our district, but there was not one regional station in our district that I felt safe in. Um, it, it looked, a lot of them, just when you kind of compare it, I guess, to the Howard County side, it's very clear that we have a lot of work that we could do. Um, and so I'm hoping that we can kind of develop around those stations and make it like a warm and welcoming area that people would want to go to and from in order, to, especially if you're commuting, you know, from this area to DC. Um, the one that I think was probably my least favorite out of all was definitely the one that was like Laurel Racetrack. I was a little surprised that, you know, the, um, to walk into the actual area, it was so low in terms of the ceiling um, and it was dark and, and just, you know, kind of scary. The platform was small. There was nowhere to really stand. There was nowhere to sit. Um, so that was definitely one. And that's actually the one that's closest to kind of where I live in Russet didn't know about it and probably wouldn't use it the way it is right now. Um, so just wanted to make note of that. And then I just feel like there's definitely a lot of opportunity to kind of help with improving Fort Meade as much as we can. Um, that was my first time actually touring like a, a military base, but just kind of, uh, you know, seeing the stark contrast between some of the newer areas that were developed versus some of the other older areas and like the housing itself. So that was something else I kind of included in notes. I, I put down like, uh, felt a little bit cold in certain areas. Um, I definitely noted the no sidewalks and they explain why. Um, no walking trails. I didn't really notice that very much while I was there. Um, and I guess they have like their own facilities for, for people to kind of eat that and like on the base and it's mess halls that they have and chow halls, but I just didn't get to see that. And I know that military bases might have a different um, different rules when it comes to like the outside facade of the buildings, but a lot of them just kind of look the same to me. So I couldn't really tell much of a difference. Uh, and that's it, I'll, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. That's really, really comprehensive. Um, anybody else? Um, uh, for me, I, I really enjoyed the tour, to be honest. Um, I remember, I think it was in, um, Nicole's um, neighborhood, I, if I don't remember the street, Nicole, um, the streets are very small. There's no sidewalks. I'm a little bit concerned about children, um, especially during the winter time when it's very, it's still dark, um, waiting for bus. I'm a little bit worried about that area. And also new development. I noticed that this, um, the roads are very narrow. 
some concern about that. And we talked about Broderick, which um, I live in that area. I'm always concerned when I'm driving there because of no sidewalk. Um, also the um, Whiskey Bottom area, I'm also concerned about that area as well. Um, and I think that's another area we went to in Rosset. I don't remember that section. I think it's more like uh, you can do hiking there. It's not well kept, to be honest. I think we can do a whole lot more um, development in that area as well. Um, so I'm just concerned about safety when it comes to the roads. Um, also the, um, the MAC train, I think it's in Jessup. Um, to be honest, I never knew there was a train station there. And it doesn't, like um, Kisha said, I, will I don't think I will even take that train. Um, I will not use that. It's not safe. And also the racetrack, um, it's very low. I remember when we're trying to walk down, we have to bend a little bit, even though I'm not that tall, but I'm worried about hitting my head. So that's, and also that I felt like we could do better in that area as well. Racetrack has great potential and I feel like we need to, it needs to be better. So those are my, I'm just concerned about safety um, and the roadsides really. Thank you, I'm done, thank you. No, that's great, Kimmy, thank you so much. Who else? Well, we had lots of great conversations, so it's good to share them again, just because unfortunately we were all in the same bus. Yeah, Nicole? So like Kemi mentioned, um, in the Shipley Meadows, you know, there's not that sidewalk to, um, for the kids to walk. Um, traffic safety said there was enough street width that we could put one. The lighting is dark. Um, so there's the concern for the kids catching the bus either in the morning or night, depending on whether it's daylight savings time. I was happy to hear that there is a plan for 175 for the 295 on and off ramps um especially with the race road you know they put in those yellow pylons and people are going around them and making like illegal u-turns or what have you so i hope that that's part of the 175 295 on off ramp so i'm interested to see how that's all going to play out so that will hopefully alleviate but by the elms um development there's like this constant water so we didn't really get to talk about it much because we looked at the trusty friend or whatever, but by that development, there's like constant water um, where that meets 175. There's like a church on the corner. And then a little bit before that, there's like an exit for the Elms development. There's constant water in the road. Um, and when the weather gets below freezing, it always freezes and it's like a sheet of ice there. So I'm not sure if there's something with the, the piping underground or it's runoff or from the landscaping or what, but there's constant water there and that needs to be explored. Um, so we didn't get to talk about it much because we kind of blew past that, um, but that really does need to be looked at. Um, and then just some of the things that everybody else mentioned with what Mark is doing down in 295, I mean, down at um, the racetrack and the planned, um, somebody showed a picture of it. I don't know if it was the economic development guy, um, but the planned renovation for the Mark station down there is lovely. And we kind of mentioned it in our bus tour, maybe if they could do a little brushing up of the Jessup station, paint, you know, repaving the parking lot, putting up some signage, putting some striping there, you know, not much investment, but just something like none of us ever knew that it was there but there's maybe some minor improvements that could be done. And there was some discussion on CSX owns the tracks, but Mark own, or like somebody else owns something. So I, I guess there's this tug of war as to who is responsible for what. So I think that would be part of the issue. Um, but there could be some minor sprucing up that was a little lesser investment um, it doesn't have to be a whole savage redo, but you know, something that could be done to spruce up um, the Jessup to let people know, because it is in the industrial section, but it, it's horrid and nobody's going to use it. <laughs> but it does have some nice parking there, you know, that's free. So great, Nishara. Nishara, we can't. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi, sorry. <laughs> I'm in my car. I just wanted to speak because my phone is about to die. Um, it's 
been a great conversation. I wasn't able to talk earlier because of the space that I was in. Um, but I really appreciate you guys taking all that. Um, so a couple of things. Um, well, I was kind of surprised, I guess, by like how much, like how many things weren't really advertised to the residents that already exist there. Like how she just said, like a lot of people didn't even know that that train station existed or the, um, like the park, I think that, I think that you were most shocked by, cause you like, you said you like to go to parks and everything, um, being surprised that they're literally right there in the area. And um, it's just not a lot of people know about it. There's not really signs anywhere. There's not really, you know, nothing showing um, the different places that people can kind of enjoy. Um, especially because of COVID, a lot of people were trying to take more time out to enjoy their family, enjoy like the little thing, the little things. Um, so just having that there. Um, the other thing, like they said, was the sidewalks. Um, I never actually noticed the sidewalk problem until it was really brought up because like it'll randomly just go and just stop like in random areas or even where there's like bus stops in some areas there weren't sidewalks, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. It's like just grassy areas or no coverage or anything like that. Um, so that was helpful. Um, and then also like the upkeep and stuff, referring back to like the train station and stuff like that, just so people know that it's there and also just taking care of it. Like it's part of our community. So being able to take care of that um, would actually show, you know, that they care about us and our community. And um, so we have, like, this is where we, we live and where we go through um, daily. So we should just keep up with the upkeep. Um, my favorite thing, part of the tour was definitely, let me sure my battery's not about to die. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> my favorite part of the tour was, I forgive me because I cannot remember the full name of the, at the condos, but the, the middle millions or something like that, I think it was. Uh, I'm probably saying it wrong, but that was my favorite part of the tour, like seeing that they're building something and they're taking notice, you know, of um, different people. I am, I'm 26, so I'm in that like kind of like weird age um, where it's like we're trying to like get our careers and stuff, but also like a lot of us don't have a lot of money right now because <laughs> we're either just getting out of college or um, we're, um, you know, trying to find footing and we're still having to live at our parents' house because nobody can afford anything right now. Um, which I also appreciated um, Mr. Franco's words um, concerning that. Um, the data that was given um, by um, the previous data that was given about like the, the jobs and the, the population and all that was very helpful to give a lot of insight. Um, but also like when they were saying they're looking for jobs, they can't find nobody to fill these positions. A lot of us are not taking those positions because we can't afford to live those positions. And this we have two or three jobs at once and there's a lot of people doing that and it's burning them out so either raising the wage um or um supporting you know something like that so that we can actually not only just survive but actually thrive because if you have a community where they're always trying to save money and then you can't buy anything you're not going to have anyone coming in your stores to support even if you did hire people so uh, I really appreciated that conversation. I don't want to drag out too long, uh, but I thought that was a very um, good outlook and um, a very good thing that was mentioned um, because we are, you know, trying to build community where people want to live in these places and want to, you know, uh, well, it's the, I know the housing market is crazy right now, but eventually buy homes, um, be able to go to these schools that you guys are planning on building and putting all this money into if you want us to be able uh, to, to live in these areas, to go to these places, you know, it needs to be a place where people want to go and can go and actually live. So be glad that rather than just looking at a map, we were able to drive around and indulge in like every little part of the community that was on the tour. Um, I lived on Fort Meade and realized how much was on the other side of the base. <laughs> so this driving tour was very helpful. And <laughs> right, well, thank you so much. I'm really glad we were able to get that perspective from you because I know we had a really great conversation on the bus. So thank you. Um, anybody else? Oh, Patience. Oh. Yes, patient. Um, all right, some of my stuff is the same. I'm sorry. I didn't, I wasn't sure if the other person was done. Um, yeah, no, you're fine. Yep. 
So one of the things I thought was really nice is one of the apartments we stopped at um, that saved a historical part of the building and then kind of built around it and um, just made that area really nice. And there were there were walking, there were buildings or businesses in walking distance. So it can it combined old, new, as well as commercial. So I thought that was really nice. I definitely agree with the 295, 175 on off ramp. It is really dangerous and I hope we do something about that as well as the, the train stations, especially at the Laurel Racetrack. First of all, I didn't know it was there either, but it is it is very dark even when you get up after you go underneath everything and go up to the station. It just seems very dark and unsafe. And if you don't know it's there, you're never going to use it anyway, no matter what we do to it. So hopefully we can somehow build that up and be able to use it. And it's really a little, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the word I'm thinking of, but you look across and you see that Howard kind Howard County part of it, and it's built up and it's really nice and it's very inviting. And then you look around our Anne Arundel County side and it's not. So we definitely need to do something about that. That's it for me. Great. Anybody else? Well, uh, I'll make my comments and then someone else comes up with something, but we can end with me if that, that works. Um, yeah, I, I just fully agree with everybody. It was so helpful to see the pieces. Um, I definitely want to bring up the sidewalk thing. I know it seems insignificant, but it's really not for a lot of people. So I think that that, that is really important is having walkable, livable communities. And then I think the affordability is a really key issue. Um, you know, seeing the numbers tonight from Anne Arundel Economic Council and just the fact that so many people are commuting in, I actually thought it was the other way around. So that was like really interesting to me that the people that live here aren't working here. Um, and the people that work here are coming from all over everywhere else. But so that means that they're in cars. That means that they're commuting, they're clogging up the roads or using those on off ramps. Um, and that's a concern, especially as we're looking at, you know, as Sherry told us at Fort Meade, they're looking at at least another 5,000 jobs that they know of, of coming to the base. And we've seen some infrastructure improvements, but we haven't seen near enough. And I give Fort Meade a lot of credit and Sherry, her team, you know, they do a very good PR job of highlighting how great the Ford is. And it is, it's the largest employer. It's got a lot of really great things, but for those of us that have to live around Fort Meade, there, there are issues. And I think sometimes that kind of gets whitewashed over with how great the Ford is. Um, and it is great, but we also need to fact that if you're going to have the largest employer there, you need to be investing in the community around it. So that way we can have proper living with it as well. So I think that it's just something that hopefully we can kind of take advantage of as we think about our plans. But once again, I just, I can't thank Carrie and Mark enough for, for putting it together. And also all of you, it's National Volunteer Week. So thank all of you for volunteering your time. Um, and taking, you know, a, a Saturday or a Sunday out of your day, I know that, you know, um, that, that's a lot. And then I know tonight's meeting was a lot. So before I kind of go to next steps, any anybody, I don't want to cut anybody else off if someone has comments. I don't see any other raised hands, but okay. Um, so, you know, and I just want to remark as well, um, you know, my goal is for our meetings not to be two and a half hours long. So, you know, we'll make sure, I, I really want to be cognizant of your time and I thank everybody for, for being so attentive. Um, and, you know, I promise that we'll make sure that our agendas, you know, fit in the future to not be so much um, with that. So, um, Mark, I know we have some, any final next steps that I need to, that we should cover before we adjourn? No, just as far as next steps, our next meeting is is in May and we have transportation on the agenda. There are a few different aspects of transportation. There's, you know, there's transportation planning, there's transportation or traffic engineering, as well as development review. So um, we're going to have those folks in attendance next month. So it's really just going to be one topic, transportation, but know that there's a lot to sort of dig into in that conversation. Um, we'll prepare the uh, similar materials that you received beforehand. Thanks to Carrie for packaging that up all really nicely. 
Um, hopefully that was a, a benefit to you all and, and a good resource in preparation for tonight's meeting. Um, so again, we'll we'll prepare something similar for this upcoming meeting on transportation. Um, we typically send out another email next week with just some reminders and some other things to look forward to. So uh, again, be on the lookout for that email. And I do mean that be on the lookout for that email, whether it's your Gmail account that you hopefully have now forwarded to either your personal account or you are checking your Gmail account. So again, just a reminder to, to, to continue uh, monitoring those, those accounts. So um, again, we'll, Carrie and I will be in touch over the next uh, week or two with some more information. Carrie, am I forgetting anything? <laughs> um, just to continue to add to the Jamboard as you mull, like mm -hmm. process things that you heard or make connections between say the economic development presentation and the need for improving transit stations or housing affordability. I mean, a lot of these observations can play into recommendations for the plan. Um, I just wanna add that. And then it looks like, Kemi, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, regarding, so anytime they send um, like the public or people from the community sends email to us, um, even though it doesn't require a response, are we supposed to discuss those questions? Um, so that's something I just wanted to find out. Um, I think I've gotten, I've, I've seen two emails. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was just wondering, that's just my question. That's a great question. Yeah, Kimmy, I think that's something that definitely, I think if, as you get those, if you want to forward it, you know, to, to me and Keisha, we can add that to the agenda. Um, you know, because I, I think, you know, if you think it's valid pieces or, you know, whenever, whenever, but yes, I mean, I think if there's things that you're curious about or that's been brought up from the public, I definitely want to discuss it. Nicole? Um, I wanted to ask Mark and Carrie, with the bill that was introduced in the essay or at the county council last night 3122 with this whole rezoning thing within four miles of um fort meade you know when you take that and draw a circle that's all in region two so i'm kind of like if that's going to go through then what are we doing here you know what i mean it's if that's going to go through and it's you know with um Mr. Kraft explaining, which is one of the questions I had, he explained that it's only for the certain things or what have you, that pertains to just region two and it kind of eliminates certain zoning and whatever decisions that would have been forthcoming for us. So I'm kind of like, okay, so what are we doing now? Well, I think there's still a lot more work that you can all be doing and and again, this is this is one bill, one action um, that the uh, administration has the prerogative to do. Um, but again, is it, I mean, you've heard from how many different um, agencies today that we're still going to need to provide recommendations on, and we haven't even again gotten to transportation, land use, environmental resources, cultural resources, um, a variety of other items. So, you know. Don't feel discouraged that there, there is a current I, right, bill. I feel like that is really like negating the land use decisions or the zoning decisions that would have been for us to make as a committee. Don't get me wrong, the county council has the purview to do mm -hmm. what they do, but there's a reason and a purpose for this committee and the zoning and planning decisions that would have been forthcoming from us. And I feel like that bill tr is a slap in the face to this committee and the reason it was put in place to make those zoning and planning decisions. So I'm gonna jump in and encourage folks to check out the community forums that we shared the recordings for um, that happened yesterday. There's some questions answered about this bill and some of the concerns that you're sharing, Nicole. Um, one thing that our administrator said was, you know, you, you're citizens and if you don't like legislation that's being forwarded or if you do like legislation, um, please advocate for or against it to the county council. That's your prerogative. Um, but it sounds like there's an interest in having more information and questions answered about this bill. And frankly, Mark and I just don't have that information right now. So. Well, okay, um, he and Mark is heavily involved in it. And that's why I'm asking you. 
I don't have, we don't have more information to provide at this exact moment, but I would really uh, enjoy the opportunity to answer those questions. So if you can send me a few, um, we're talking to our staff, our fellow staff about this and trying to figure out um, the, what it could mean and we will get back to you. Nicole, I agree with the, what was that bill number? It's 3122, because OPZ and Mark's name is specifically mentioned in it, which is why I'm asking you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, that's something I did want to bring up too, Nicole. I'm glad you, you did, because I feel like this piece of legislation, it's like a game of telephone. And the, the more it gets out there, the it's, it's really it's really changing and evolving. And I don't, I really can't make heads or tails of what it means. Um, so, you know, I think getting some background, because I do agree, there is a concern on one point of, yeah, why are we doing this huge amount of work, which this is a huge amount of work. We just spent three hours, we, we did all these car rides, we've done all this work. And then for them to then just, you know, change zoning without really consulting, it's, it, it is, it is an odd thing. So, I think getting more background on this would be really valuable. And I think it's a, it's a question that needs to be answered. Um, and, you know, I mean, if staff can reach out to council and Prusky's office and see, you know, how this fits into the SAC process, because, you know, once again, we were appointed, we all apply. I mean, this has been a lot of work for us. And if council's just going to come in and, and make changes without any input, then, you know, we kind of need to know what our, what our role is here and, and how we help out. And so um, that would be helpful uh, to have. Especially for all those of us, you know, I know Jim and others are experts in all this stuff, but I'm not. So, you know, this is really hard when you start talking about R10, A10 and all these numbers and think, you know, I mean, but, you know, we're trying to learn here. So I think any help we can get. Yeah, maybe we can carve out some time at our, on the May agenda to talk about yeah. this a little bit more. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, please continue to do the Jamboard and look out for emails. And uh, we will uh, we will have a virtual meeting in, Mar in May again. So it will be virtual. We'll consider in-person. Uh, maybe we can discuss in May, too, about in-person meetings and kind of coming up with a plan for those as we move forward, uh, if folks feel comfortable. So, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. Happy National Volunteers Week. Thank you for all you do. Bye.